Welcome to the uh, May 17th uh, Cannabis Advisory Committee meeting here in beautiful Oakland. Can we uh, start with the roll call, please? Bavillion. Cermak. Here. Clifford. Here. Dombrowski. Here. Farrow. Here. Heidelback Terremoto. Harada. Here. Huffman. Jacobson. Here. Leff. Here. Lynch. Here. Nevidal. Here. Nikita. Here. Peck. Here. Ron. Here. Stevenson. Here. Sweeney. Todd. Here. Williams. Here. Woolsey. Here. Wu. Here. You. Here. Quorum is established. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. We have uh, opening remarks from uh, Dean Grafilo, Director, Department of Consumer Affairs. Chair Ron and members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be before you again, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I want to thank every member of this committee and your time and service, your expertise, perspective, and insight, which collectively reflect an incredibly diverse range of stakeholders, have provided critical input for the department and the Bureau. The work of this committee and its subcommittees have been, help, have been extremely helpful to all licensing entities who are working on the final rulemaking package. I also want to recognize the stakeholders and members of the public who have joined us this morning and have joined us at all our previous meetings. Your feedback has been and continues to be vital in ensuring that our state moves forward with implementation in a thoughtful manner. It's a, it's a personal pleasure to see many of you here and as I've seen you at previous ones before truly indication of how invested all of you are in this endeavor. As we continue to build a stable legal market for the cannabis industry that is supported by a comprehensive and meaningful set of regulations, I encourage everyone to continue to provide feedback and to stay engaged with this process. Today, the committee will tackle a number of issues on the agenda. Your experience and your voice are integral to this conversation. You're all playing an important role in shaping regulations that help strengthen consumer protection and reduce the illegal market for cannabis. Once again, thank you for being at the table and being at the forefront of implementing history for our state. With this, I will now pass the mic to Deputy Chief Ramil. Good morning, everyone. Melanie Ramel, Deputy Chief with the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Just wanted to share that, unfortunately, Chief Ajax could not be with us today. She is in Sacramento at the Capitol um, testifying during the, the budget hearings. Um, but we both wanted to thank you for being here and thank the committee for their hard work over these months as they've been providing their uh, recommendations and response to the regulations. Thank you. Okay, uh, first on the agenda, review and approval of the March 15th Cannabis Advisory Committee meetings from our meeting in Los Angeles. Do we have a uh, motion for approval? And a second? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, could you say your names when you uh, make the motion and second please for note takers? Sir Mac with the... Pharaoh second. Pharaoh second. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Any public comment related to the motion? Yes. Do I push a button? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. David Fluor, Um I, I saw in the minutes, usually it says no comment in the uh, welcomes. Right. If you look at the minutes from last meeting, nobody had a comment about your guys' welcome. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you for welcoming us here. I'm happy you're going to listen to our voices and uh, take what we have to say into consideration. I really greatly appreciate it. For everybody behind me, I think they appreciate it too. We've got a big, big program, 1,500 employees, $300 million. Jeez, uh, you know, department. And um, as far as... Thank you. The counter going? Yes. Oh, I didn't even see it. <laughs> Sorry. So my name is Rebecca Nicholas, and I'm going to facilitate today's meeting to make sure that you all get a chance to speak. We have a little bit different setup today. Usually you can see the time, but there's a light system right in front of you, so it'll be green, yellow, and then red when it's over. So I, I did not you. know that. Can I? 
finish my comments real quickly. Um, I just I just wanted to make a note that it is the depth of minutes, and, and it's kind of funny to follow from meeting to meeting and the minutes and what people say and actually going to the meetings. And um, I'm happy to see so much of what we said in the last meeting is here in this agenda. And um, I know at last meeting, it ended with we should change the agenda and talk about important things like the equi equity issue. And uh, I just love how the, the minutes reflect that point of view of everybody that was there in the room last year, or, or March 15th. I had Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other uh, comments from members? All right, can we uh, take a vote? Sir Mack? Aye. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Leff? Abstain. Lynch? Abstain. Nevidal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Peck? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Todd? Aye. Williams? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, moving on. Um, so, let's see, going back a few months, we all recall we went through the um, subcommittees, a variety of uh, topics. Um, in Los Angeles, we went through the uh, subcommittee reports and recommendations uh, with only three of the subcommittees remaining for uh, discussion today. First one is a discussion and pop possible action to approve, modify, or reject subcommittee on licensing application recommendations. Uh, can we get a report from the uh, chair of that subcommittee, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Beverly Yu. So the licensing application subcommittee held two meetings in February and March to discuss and develop recommendations to improve the state's licensing process. We received feedback through the online survey and during public comment. Want to thank everyone who took the time to participate in these meetings, my colleagues for their insight, and the Bureau staff for their support throughout the entire process. In the interest of time, I plan on making several motions. I would like to discuss recommendations one, two, three, and six first, and discuss recommendations four and five separately. Recommendation number one is related to labor standards. The recommendation is that applicants should be required to submit a plan for compliance with labor standards and disclose previous labor law violations. We heard the need for this recommendation in our subcommittee the emergence of cannabis businesses and the legal market has raised valid concerns around worker safety and employer responsibilities. Having a plan in place would help protect both the applicant's business as well as the health, safety, and well-being of their employees. The, this recommendation is provided in part to supplement existing statute to ensure that all licensees meet minimum state standards for health and safety and worker protections. The second part of the recommendation is to allow licensing authorities to receive disclosure of any previous labor law violations from applicants. The staff comments from BCC, Business and Professions Code Section 26051.5 requires an applicant to submit to the licensing authority specific <coughs> procedures which do not include compliance with labor standards. Additionally, Business and Professions Code Section 26051 contains requirements related to labor peace agreements. If the regulations were amended as recommended, the licensing authorities would need additional resources to obtain documentation related to previous labor law violations, um, review the information, and make determinations as to whether a license will be denied based on these violations. Further, this evaluation would extend the time to process an application while the prior violations are investigated and evaluated. Uh, moving along to recommendation number two, related to disclosure of owners. The recommendation is to require an applicant for an annual license who lists any corporation or other entity as an owner to also disclose the names of the owner or owners of the corporation or other entity. 
To give some background, the subcommittee heard concerns regarding a small number of large consolidated businesses dominating California's cannabis market and the need to include safeguards in the licensing process. So this recommendation simply closes a loophole. Staff comments, an owner includes a person with an aggregate ownership interest of 20% or more and the person applying for a license, which can include a firm, association, corporation, limited liability company, or other entity. Any owner that is an entity is required to be disclosed to the Bureau. The regulations could be amended to clarify this requirement. Um, recommendation number three relates to the information from corporation owners. The, the recommendation is to require any corporation or other entity listed on the annual license application who has a financial interest to disclose the name, birth date, and copy of government issued identification for all individuals who are the owner, owners of the corporation or other entity. These individuals shall not be required to submit the information required of owners under section 5002 C 20. So this is a similar recommendation to the previous one to increase transparency in the financial interest portion of the annual license application. And during our subcommittee discussion, we added the second part of the recommendation to eliminate extensive paperwork from individuals who are the owner or owners of the corporation or entity. Staff comments, business and professions code section 2605.1.2, subdivision D requires that the application include a list of every person with a financial interest in the business to be licensed. Section 5004 of the Bureau's regulations further defines the financial interest and the information that must be provided for all individuals with financial interest. The regulations could be amended to clarify that the list must also include entities, not just individuals with a financial interest. And recommendation number six refers to the use of prepares. The, rem the recommendation is to allow the use of prepares to assist applicant in preparing applications. Staff comments from BCC, nothing in law or regulation prohibits an applicant from procuring assistance in preparing the application. Regulations can be amended to provide for language that allows a third party to submit the application on behalf of the applicant as long as the applicant is ultimately held responsible for the information submitted on its behalf. And I believe the staff recommendation hits the nail on the head. I move we adopt recommendations one, two, three, and six as drafted. Okay, thank you. Um, any other uh, comments from uh, members of the uh, subcommittee? All right, seeing none, uh, any comments from the other members? Yes, Ms. Dr. Shermack. Could you clarify um, regarding recommendations two and three, uh, what this requires over and above the temporary regulations as they currently stand? It's just more information to um, increase transparency in the annual application. So for recommendation number two, um, regarding disclosure of owners. It, the cor if there is a corporation or other entity as an owner, they would have to disclose the names of the owners okay. of the corporation or other entity, so the names. And then for recommendation number three, related to the information from corporation owners, um, if a corporation or other entity has a financial interest, then the corporation or entity would need to disclose the name, birthday, and copy of government issued ID for all the individuals who are the owners. That's Thank you. The, that's the changes. Okay. Any others? Um, on labor standards, is there any estimate from BCC in terms of how much additional time cost it will take to validate labor, you know, uh, issues, violations? Um, I don't believe that there's a specific um, number that was put in in response to this recommendation. It certainly would take additional staff time. Um, but like anything else, I think it would depend 
on um, the breadth of that information, which would vary from license application <coughs> to license application. Um, but it definitely would, would add to workload. Okay. Any others? All right, seeing none, uh, do we have a, a uh, motion or second? I'll second the motion. Oh, all right, thank you. And uh, public comment. Uh, so you. I just want to set the stage a little bit because I do see some new faces today. So um, we have, everyone has a minute and 30 seconds to make their public comment. If you want to make a public comment on the financial agenda, I think you can, but just for time's sake, if you could queue up down the center of the aisle, and then we'll take three at a time, speaker one, two, and three. And then, um, like I said, it is a little bit different today. You can see the time on the little display in front of you, and it'll be green, yellow, and red. And just a few things, um, housekeeping items. If you're looking for the restroom, it's out the door and down this hallway. Um, if you took a tag to park today, there's um, a little kiosk outside that you can get your parking validated. And um, just a reminder that we're webcasting today live, and we also have a court reporter here, so if both the members and the members of the public could speak very clearly into the microphone, that would be great. All right, let's begin. Rebecca, before you get started, I just wanted to make one other announcement for people who are in the room, just to remind you that our committee is bound by Bagley Keene, which means they, you ha they are not allowed to have meetings about um, their business outside of these, these formal meetings. And if the, you talk to them individually, it could end up being a serial meeting. So public comment really is the opportunity to address the committee. Um, so you just want to make sure everybody's aware of that so you understand that this is really the time to share your thoughts with the committee rather than one-on-one -on -one outside of the meeting setting. Thank Okay, and one other quick housekeeping item. I just wanted to make note for record that Mr. Babulian has joined the uh, committee meeting. Thank you. You're also, you're also not required to give your name for the record, just so you know. And um, we're not doing Q&A today. We're just taking your public testimony. So, all right. With that, we'll begin with Speaker Owen. Good morning, Susan Tibben. Um, I'd like to address myself to Ms. Wu's report and frankly call, in, uh, call into question the veracity of the report uh, in terms of making sure that we don't have corporatization of the state. Right now, there is no place whatsoever for the small farmer. Micro business is in no way micro. This would allow people like Steve D'Angelo to have 35 micro businesses all over the state. And so when we're referencing doing the best we can to make a space for legacy farmers, that is absolutely not the case. Thank you. All right, speaker two. Thank you, committee members. My name is Dan Georgiatis. I'm attorney for Purple Lotus Patient Center, a retail dispensary operating in San Jose. I was in both subcommittee meetings on licensing application, and I would recommend that you do nothing. Uh, these, these recommendations and the motion on the floor will harm uh, the market. You already have California law, you have the Department of Labor Industrial Standards, you have civil lawsuits that are already regulating the market. Don't overkill with these recommendations, please. You can look at recommendation six and, and have the preparers uh, be outright legal. It's probably overkill as well, uh, but I, I would recommend that you do not pass one, you do not pass two. It will seriously hamstring investment opportunities uh, if, you try, if you have to disclose even people with just minor shares in, in these companies. That's going to make money go away. Uh, and you'll be losing money already that we're, we're all, the market's already suffering from high prices. So be careful in what you do here and what you recommend, please. Uh, this is a good committee, and, and I know uh, you hear me out, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, speaker three. Dr. William Munjar. I am a licensed cannabis event organizer, second dispensary in America, Emelands, California, Cannabis Clinic. I'm going to go directly to these two things that we're looking at. On the labor standards, my question is simply, those are generally for how many employees are required for this labor standard applicant to submit required document. How many employees is that for that to be effective? Also on the disclosure of owners, 
I find it acceptable completely under law that anyone with a 20% or greater aggregate report, but according to the law, it does state that anyone under at 19% does not disclose. And that is a common, uh, common business practice that I believe is 100% acceptable. But my question is, is on the labor standards, how many employees is required for that to be applicable? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to speaker one. Hello, my name is Josh Virginia's with Loyal Penguin Incorporated. Um, I come to you today to draw attention to the furtherance of regulation in an already extremely regulated field. Um, you know, we talked about micro businesses. You, you have small mom and pop farms that are trying to comply. They are getting money from outside investors, but they're not primary stake. And continuing to place those regulatory barriers to entry into the market is going to push people right back into the black market and you're not going to accomplish what you are seeking to accomplish now. You know, we as an industry need to be able to come out of the shadows and come into a well-regulated market that the state of California is attempting to do. But the furtherance of regulations, the furtherance of disclosures, when it's already very apparent that our companies are giving as much transparency as possible, that is just placing the, the assumption and the uh, presumption of guilt on these companies that there's something wrong. You know, myself, I'm a veteran. I come back from Afghanistan, two tours. I come here to further regulation. You won't even follow the laws that are already on the books. And then we were talking about putting on more. So please take this into consideration. And I am requesting that uh, recommendations one, two, three, and five, which are all the regular, all the recommendations on the four be uh, denied. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, speaker two. Good morning, uh, Sabrina Fendrick with Berkeley Patients Group in support of recommendations two and three. Um, if you don't disclose the names of owners of corporations um, behind corporations, then you could ultimately have a loophole that could be used by a company like Philip Morris, who could ostensibly apply for a license through a shell company, and nobody would know. We all need to compete on an equal and transparent playing field. All right, speaker three. Hi, I'm Joseph Aroni from the Sweet Leaf Collective. Uh, I'm here representing the California Compassion Coalition uh, for recommendation number four, annual fees. Uh, the CCC recommendation is non-remuneration compassion cannabis activities and programs donating 100% of the organization's cannabis at no cost to qualified at-risk communities should be fully exempted from all state taxes and fees. Potential future exploration could be fee tiers that take into account the total percentage of donated material equal to appropriate tax and fees exemptions for hybrid programs. Uh, so basically, we, we don't want to see any fees for our compassion programs. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move to speaker one. Real quick, for, for clarification, uh, we're, all we're taking comment on right now are recommendations one, two, three, and six. Uh, your, your comments on four are noted, but uh, we're just talking about those right now. We'll get to the rest uh, in just a bit. Okay, well, we will come back for five. Uh, good morning. I'm John Brower from Trinity County, and uh, I want to encourage the committee to uh, approve of these. I think uh, the transparency of ownership is vital. Um, on Trinity, we have uh, permitted about 300, uh, up to 10,000 square foot cultivators. Many of them are second, third generation folks that uh, really go the extra mile to do things right, and uh, we need every advantage we can for these small folks. Um, uh, another advantage that, uh, that they could have is the ability to use a preparer for their state licensure. Our Trinity County permittees, uh, it's well over half of uh, 300 plus of them that uh, have used a preparer or an agent or a, a consultant uh, for help. And as these uh, applications require uh, greater detail in plans and, and uh, things, it, it really helps to bring professionals into it. Uh, I want to take this opportunity also to encourage you to stick to this July 1st uh, uh, moment, which is the real start date for our industry, uh, and 
fully implement track and trace and lab pass, uh, our patients and adult use consumers really need a distinction in the marketplace between safe, quality assured product and other product. And uh, like I said, in Trinity County, we, uh, we're well prepared for this and we've got over 300 cultivators that are ready for business uh, that can pass labs, but there's currently just not demand for that product and we need all the help we can get. Thank you, have a good morning. All right, speaker three. Yeah, so I represent um, equity community and, and uh, talking about disclosure of ownership. Um, I think it's, it's clear that we do need transparency, but uh, disclosure of ownership in, in a lot of cases hurts the equity people and also undocumented workers are, would be at risk of being put into jeopardy for, for that type of information getting out in terms of the workers and, and the owners as well. I think we do need transparency, but I think that we need to do it in a way that is not exclusive, exclusionary of small business. And the more we regulate and the more we put fees, it makes it harder and harder for small businesses to get into, into this. The more of these, these programs that they have to adhere to, it just makes it completely more difficult. We're already having a problem with small business, small growers having access to this industry. Um, and with every little thing that we put on them, we're putting more cost into their overhead, which is shutting down and making it more inclusive for big business and corporations to just move in who have the assets and, and the resources available to, to adhere to all of this. So I just want to say that we need to take into consideration the equity, people of color, and especially with the environment that's going on, the protections of the undocumented workers and allowing them to get documented, we're putting them at risk with this disclosure. So take that into consideration, please. Thank you. All right, we'll move to speaker one. Yes, hi, my name is Tony Williams, and I live uh, a senior in West Lisa in Pacifica. And uh, my question is about the Sunset Club. Uh, my wife and I started our collective in 2016, and currently we are in the process of waiting for our permit in Pacifica. But our, the chief in Pacifica is really uh, forcing us now to try to close our doors instead of allowing us to operate based under the sunset clause. And I just like some clarity about that because they're even uh, putting pressure on our current landlord to uh, push us out if we don't close our doors. And we have done everything to be in compliance with everything that they've asked for. They state that we're in a violation of not having a license, but the thing is there was no license in place, and when it came available, we applied for it. And uh, we're just wanting to get a better understanding of the sunset clause, and can they actually force us to close like that? Thank you. All right, speaker two. Hi, my name is Nate Heimdall. I'm representing Mother Northville. I can see a big problem that the state is doing a pretty good job on the local level. There's a lot of problems. Very difficult. You can't approach the state before you figure out the local level. Uh, a lot of Californians have what's called cannabis desert, where the citizens have to drive over 100 miles to go purchase legal cannabis. So the proof, proof, proof is in the pudding. California is the first state to weigh underperforming tax revenue for the first quarter. This is from the cultivation. Collected 1.6 million. This is 148 dollars a pound. That means only 11,000 pounds have been taxed in a state that consumes about two and a half million pounds, which is close to be about 265,000 pounds a month. If there's some way to take some of the local control away so we can actually get the state license, it would be preferable. Thank you. Uh, Ross Gordon, I'm here on behalf of California Growers Association. Um, we are a group that represents over a thousand small and independent cannabis businesses, um, largely though not exclusively uh, cultivators. Um, wanted to speak to recommendations two and three in particular. Um, we do support these recommendations. Uh, we had a, a large conversation among our membership yesterday, um, and while there's not total consensus, I think the predominant view um, is that uh, these recommendations would um, ensure that large uh, corporations uh, don't have the ability to hide behind uh, shell companies without disclosing 
um, the fact that they're involved in that way. Um, there was some concern among some of our members. Uh, this could make raising investment more difficult in some cases if people didn't want to uh, disclose uh, their identity on application. Maybe they don't invest. But I think despite that concern, um, the, the feeling was overwhelmingly positive about these recommendations um, and feeling that they're, they're more targeted towards big corporate interests and don't create additional disclosure uh, requirements on smaller businesses. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, speaker one. Uh, hi. I would like to speak in strong support of recommendation number one uh, for labor standards. Uh, personally, as a chemist who has worked in the industry, uh, there aren't even regulations that exist for us to operate within, uh, be it OSHA or other workplace standards, for us to look to. And uh, for that reason, I would like to make a specific recommendation um, with respect to looking at um, past OSHA violations and requiring, uh, here's a very specific one for you, you, you require a fume hood, a, a, a box where we can safely formulate volatile chemicals uh, that are actually dangerous to us even though they're found in the plant, but because they're in such high concentrations, exposure to them without this uh, small, it costs about $10,000 to have something like this installed. So companies that are making hundreds of millions of dollars and neglecting their workers to for this simple requirement uh, is unacceptable. So I'd just like to make that specific recommendation that a fume hood is required for safe formulation of vape pen cartridges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker two. Hi there, I work at a, a consulting firm that helps people get through the licensing process. Um, I think that for many of the people that we speak to, this is in regards to labor standards. It's a piece that I don't see mentioned in the recommendation. But um, for many of the people who are operating in the gray or black market, um, the employment opportunities in this industry are going to be the big opportunities. Um, making sure that there are some sort of uh, um, uh, benefits to hiring people out of the gray and black market and having some way to prove that you are doing that um, is going to be important if, if our plan is to decrease the size of that market um, over time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaker three and then we'll go back to one. Good morning, my name is Melanie Luther and I'm an attorney at Short Sign Superior Dorman and Summers here today on behalf of UFCW Western States Council to express support for advisory committee recommendation one. Recommendation two and three are also consistent with our public comments on the regulations. As to recommendation one, uh, we offer our strong support for requiring applicants to submit a plan for compliance with labor standards and to disclose previous labor law violations. This recommendation is similar to other requirements already contained in the application process and is not substantially more onerous than any of these other requirements. For example, the Bureau uh, already will have to engage in, in much more nuanced vetting with regards to prior criminal history of, applica of applicants. Um, Communication between agencies is essential for smooth operations of any statewide regulatory program and should be implemented as eventually and as soon as possible. How, however, the regulation should also require self-reporting under penalty of perjury in order to reduce the amount of time and resources expended by the Bureau. As a union, UFCW knows that undocumented workers are always more protected when strong labor standards are in place. We are thankful for the committee's efforts to ensure effective regulations are in place from the start of this rapidly growing industry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, speaker one. Yes, uh, Ray Pers, um, <clears throat> a consultant, cannabis consultant. On item number one, um, we're looking at, and I don't see anything about contract labor. Uh, everybody knows labor is very expensive, uh, so expensive costs. So is there anything to be added in for contract labor uh, with the contract that they follow what's in here? Um, so they'll sign an agreement um, working directly with a farmer or, you know, a retailer who wants to have, you know, contract uh, uh, employees. So if we could add something to that or find out, you know, is that a lie, uh, you know, is allowed? And then under the preparers, um, I know you're saying an agreement between the uh, licensed uh, uh, company and, and the preparer, 
but what about you know liability that could transfer over and making sure that in there if a preparer fills that out um, the state wouldn't say you know hey you filled it out you're liable and um, I think it might need to be specifically stated in there maybe the uh, uh, the applicant present something to um, the, the you know the, the in the application process to state that hey we've got this agreement and no liability uh, will carry over to the uh, preparer so thank you very much thank you all right speaker two good morning my name is Vera Levitt Casey I'm the compliance officer and human resources director for mankind dispensary in San Diego California first I'd like to thank the licensing subcommittee for their hard work in addressing all of these recommendations. I know we worked very hard in that committee, so thank you for all the work that you did. <clears throat> this specifically, this comment specifically addresses recommendation number three. In regards to government issued identification disclosure for all corporate owners, I'm requesting language within that recommendation that the personal addresses, home addresses of those owners be reserved specifically for BCC staff only and not posted on any website. Currently there are quite a few folks that have gotten personal information from the BCC website. I get lots of phone calls to my personal cell phone um, from those applications. So if we could just throw that in there, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Speaker three. <clears throat> Tim Moreland on behalf of uh, River Distributing on the Compliance and Policy Director. Um, I have a question, um, and I don't know if this is the proper form about recommendation three, the way it's written. Um, for instance, say there's a publicly traded company, would, would you have to list all of the information for all of the shareholders since they have a financial interest in the company? Um, We're just taking testimony, sorry. Okay. Um, just form well, that into in a the, comment. In that yeah. event, um, <laughs> I would hold off on recommending um, probably no on that until there's some type of clarification. Uh, you are, River's going through an acquisition right now with a publicly traded company the way this is written, the way I interpret it, is that all of the 20 plus thousand shareholders would have to supply this information that's written in this recommendation. So um, I'll urge a no vote. Thank you. Speaker one. Hi, I'm Nolan Mori from TerraTech Corp. I work as a compliance specialist there. And in regards to recommendation two and three, um, we've previously discussed with BBC that we've um, we are publicly traded and our owners and shareholders should be disclosed and we want transparency, but we should add a certain clause saying that corporate officers, directors, board members who control more than 20% of the stock issued by the corporation must be disclosed. And if none exists, CEO must sign under a penalty of perjury, then no shareholder, officer, director, or member of the board retain 20% of the total stock issued by the corporation. And then for being a publicly traded corporation, um, financial interest could shift very easily as we can have 5% ownership pivot very, very quickly on an openly traded market. I want that to be considered. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning. Sam Nobel from bizstartup.com. Actually, we help uh, clients start up corporations and LLCs, and I happen to understand the formalities and all of that of corporate um, formations. So in theory, what this is saying for recommendation two and three is that I could start a corporation out in Delaware our LLC, which does not have any requirements for a statement of information or a list of officers, and then just tell you guys just any random person and give an idea of any random person. So this is kind of skewed. I think you guys should also look at foreign qualifications of corporations and corporations that are out of the state of California, which is, this is not talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. On these, on these suggestions that you guys are going to be voting on, it, it's a tough decision either way, and, and ultimately I don't think you guys are going to succeed in whatever you're trying to do. But um, as, far as, getting to, as far as getting to the office, you know, I, I'm terrible with the Internet, and so, uh, you know, I like to show up to places. And, you know, I, Rancho Cordova went to you guys' building there and everything, but can you guys put up some decorations, some information or something like that? Because the place, I don't know if you've been there, but it's not very welcoming. The people are awesome. I mean, they'll help you all day long, but, I mean, you're talking through a glass, and then they get somebody. I anyways, it's not very friendly. It'd be great if you guys took a look at it and uh, put some papers out there, maybe, you know, desk copies or something like that. I, I, how many people out here in the audience has been to that office? Has anybody? Oh, <laughs> that, 
Uh, you guys All right, do so we're taking it. comment on licensing applications. Yeah, yeah, and I'm <laughs> saying it'll be a lot more understandable to me if you have that paperwork there for me to look at because this doesn't cover it. I got 29 more seconds. I mean, yep. I'm trying to run it all the way <laughs> yeah. to the end here. Go for it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wish Mrs. Ajax would have been here to welcome us and I would have, you know, told this to you guys in that part. But, uh, you know, good luck with your, with your excellent work on, on licensing. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chair, that concludes public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments from uh, members? Can I, I'd just like to ask a question of the committee, a clarifying question. So I read it to mean on, on recommendation about disclosure of owners um, of companies that own, fit the definition of ownership under the regulations. Does that, does the definition of ownership of 20%, is your intent that that applies to the requirement of ownership of the company so that once you're looking behind, a company owns 20% or more, then they have to disclose ownership of 20% more of their company or is it every individual owner if it's publicly traded? Yes, I believe it would be 20%. Um, that would be the um, basis of whether it meets the definition of owner for the corporation, and then in terms of the owner of the corporation, it would be 20% as well. Okay, that's how I read it. I Thank just want to make sure that was on time. For the clarification. I have a question regarding um, recommendation number one on labor standards. There was public comment regarding um, whether or not this covers contract labor as opposed to employees under California statute. Can you answer that? You know, we didn't go into that during our subcommittee hearing. Um, I'm not sure what the rules are in terms of going back to subcommittee to clarify, but. Uh, I would welcome any feedback from my subcommittee members. When I look at labor standards, um, I mean, is there anything explicit saying that cannabis businesses are not subject to OSHA? And because when I read this, this is much more of a backwards looking kind of requirement that you're looking back on things, right? And, you know, as the gentleman said, you know, installing, you know, uh, vents for, for guys working with volatile, you know, uh, substance makes all the sense in the world, but that's a go for basis. My fear on this subject matter is that this creates a lot more bureaucracy and you're hearing from people that they're spending a lot of time just trying to get up and running. This is one more thing that prevents them from getting up and running. Um, so I think this subject is probably more divisive than anything else. Two, three, six, could we break out one from two, three, six? Because I don't, because we have to vote on everything all at once, right? On one's that is the motion. So in that situation, I would have a tough time supporting one when I don't really have issues with anything else. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, LeVon Peck. I, I guess I was asleep at the wheel, but I didn't realize that we were going to vote on these um, all together, a one, two, three, and six. Is there any way that the motion can be amended to vote on these individually? If is that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Leff. I would like to amend the motion so that each of them, each of the issues, uh, recommendation one, uh, two, three, and six, be voted on separately. Okay, uh, Miss Yu, you you had uh, made the motion originally, I believe, so uh, you'd have to uh, amend the motion if you're willing. Okay, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Could you restate but that, please? I, I, I would like to address the concerns, though, if possible, for recommendation number one. I mean, this, this industry has traditionally been underground, and I don't, and I understand there people have issues with overcompliance, but if we do want businesses to be fully legitimate and taken seriously, I think a plan for labor, the, the minimum state labor compliance standards, so health and safety, worker protections. This is the minimum for all businesses. Just to submit that up front, I think that helps both businesses and their workers, so I, their employees, exactly. So I... We're not, I'm sorry, we're not 
communicating here. We're just having a public discussion amongst we the can, members. Thank you. Uh, as it's written right now, it's businesses with any employees. So, um, so I would I would be happy to entertain the motion to amend the motion currently on the floor to separate up the vote. Okay, so let's uh, let's take them one at a time then, please. Make a motion for the first. Uh, I make a motion to take up recommendation number one for a vote. Do what point of Go order? Ahead. Do I have to rescind my uh, second to that? Uh, no, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, we do need a second on your uh, approval for item number one. Can I Nik get a second? Nikita seconds. Okay, and let's go ahead and do a roll call vote then. I'm sorry, what was the... Do we have to have comment now that since it's been amended? Because I'd like to comment on it as well. We just did, but go ahead. No, I didn't because okay. you didn't let me um, uh, not rescind my second. Here's the deal. There's a big difference between what we talk about is having a labor peace agreement, which I think people are confusing, and the number of 20 that's been established. But it doesn't, regard, it doesn't matter whether you're an employer of one or an employer of a million. Labor standards are labor standards. And I don't think you guys really want people coming in and coming into your industry and treating... I know enough about this industry that most people in this industry look at their employees as family. And as this industry changes and the changes that you guys are all concerned about, big corporations coming in, how those workers are treated and how they're exposed are different. So I don't know what the big difference is between making sure that people report to protect the small business folks that establish this industry or protecting the workers. And I think worker protections are very important. And I think for us to stabilize this industry and to get it accepted by everyone, we need to make sure that the workers are a big piece of this industry. And it's not just the consumer of the product and not just the operator who's profiting or looking to make a profit in a business. It's the workers. Because if your workers aren't doing well and they aren't safe and they can't go every day to their family, the industry will be suffering. Thank you. Mr. Cermak? It's it strikes me that if an individual uh, is only going to maintain their health and safety by being provided the proper mask, for instance, in a, in a situation with a lot of dust, it doesn't matter if the place, workplace where they are has 100 employees or two employees, that individual needs to be treated properly in terms of safeguarding their health. Uh, so there are laws in place already that apply to all businesses, right? OSHA. So wh why are we discussing specific laws for this business when any, any registered business has to follow OSHA laws? C can you help me understand that? The reasoning is that because this industry has function primarily without any regulations, this sets a standard to begin with. This is not an existing industry, right, with OSHA around this entire time. This is just one to make sure, it's a simple step, it's a plan to comply with the existing state standards, just to show and prove at the very beginning during the annual uh, licensing application to show that the business is compliant. So. I mean, it helps the business up front, and it gives their workers a peace of mind, knowing that their businesses know that. And so is it common practice for any new business uh, in any, any other industry to disclose past labor law violations? Is that common practice? Well, it depends on the local government and their licensing authority, typically. It, the only comment I would make is this. Um, I think the point is we haven't had a lot of businesses that were not considered proper and legal since the prohibition of alcohol changed. Uh, I think there are people who are wanting to do the right thing that may not understand what the obligations under the law are. Um, we don't want to overburden the agencies and the Bureau in their enforcement and negatively put employers at risk because they did something that the ignorance of the law is no excuse. However, if they put a plan in advance 
of their application, their licensing, they clearly state a knowledge of what is expected or they can out, have outreach so they can learn exactly what is necessary and expected for them to be successful. If they enter into this business and are licensed and they end up losing their license because of these things or they end up having some tragedy with workers because they didn't know these things or they have some huge liabilities, the, the consequences that could occur to that individual group or this segment of, of uh, business could be dramatic. So at least in the beginning of this industry and in the starting of this industry, requiring somebody to acknowledge that they know what the, the plan is and how they're going to follow that plan, I think is very important. So uh, along those lines, I think OSHA has held a meeting to specifically address these issues in the cannabis business. And um, has there been any discussion? Was there any discussion um, about working with OSHA so businesses can reach out to OSHA to understand what the, the risks are and what they need to look out for? Not specifically since our last subcommittee meeting, but to your point, I do think um, workers, they, they should um, be in contact with OSHA. They should know about OSHA requirements. You know, these workers do a lot of heavy lift. Some work with heavy machinery. Some do heavy lifting. Um, some work around chemical byproducts that's brought up in public comment. And um, I mean, I think this should all be taken into consideration. Um, my understanding also is we're not just focusing on the labor standards related to OSHA law. You're looking at sexual harassment in the workplace, wage and hour violations, um, uh, several other kind of labor standards that could become um, precarious for an employer who doesn't understand what the responsibility is. Uh, and it makes workers in a very precarious space if they, you know, we've had, a, a, we have and we can turn continue to have an issue with banking, so there becomes challenges of how you pay people and how you collect their taxes and how their responsibility to, to pay their taxes as an employee is. So, you know, th this is much bigger than just the OSHA piece. OSHA, we, you know, we know that they understand that there's challenges, but there's a lot of current law that covers that as well, but. Mr. Chair, can I come? Yes, sir. Um, I've been in retail for something like 35 years now. And I think retail is probably the industry that is most closely aligned with the cannabis industry, given that we have retail operations, distribution, production. Um, in those years, I've never seen a situation where there was a, a weakness in the regulations over retail, uh, or that bad actors were able to get away with things for extended periods of time. Um, I'm really worried that we are unnecessarily worrying about problems that, that haven't been proven. I would encourage us to think about there's already plenty of regulation to go around to manage this. And if there's a problem, I'm sure that someone will fix it with additional legislation when they need it. Thank you. David Woolsey, I am concerned about the uh, additional resources needed by the Bureau and extending the time to process applications. Um, I think the quicker that we get uh, applications approved and licensees fully licensed and our program fully up and running, that's uh, better for the industry in the longer term. Uh, and there is an avenue for labor standard violations already. So I don't think we need to add um, additional regulations uh, regarding that particular component to the Bureau's work workload already. So I'd like to um, speak um, in favor of motion number one. I think this is obviously a basic worker protection. We are talking about a brand new industry. So um, to points earlier made, there are no um, references to look at um, since prohibition. I think that's really important. I think if you look at this, um, being very concerned about small businesses and small growers and s small um, you know, entities here, this is a preventive measure that allows them to make sure that they're in compliance and have basic training prior to being licensed rather than, you know, getting your license and then losing your license and then being, you know, kind of more permanently having problems getting licensed. So I think of this as really preventive for small entities and a real benefit 
I mean, we look at some of the struggles people have had with even applying for license and the amount of trainings and other things that um, the state and other entities have done to make sure people understand how to even apply. Why would we assume that people then would otherwise be able to comply with all the other much more erroneous um, labored standards that are important? So I speak um, strongly in favor of uh, motion number one. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cermak. I believe if the uh, licensing forms contain a section on uh, this compliance and if preparers uh, understand that uh, a plan is necessary, that the amount of time and effort put into uh, complying with this should be uh, relatively small. Okay. I'm going to weigh in on this one a little bit. Um, you know, arguably, I'd, I'd, I would say that uh, this isn't a brand new industry. It's been around for a while. Um, and uh, the, um, the standards of practice are already out there. Um, we, we have the state uh, code and regulation uh, surrounding labor. Uh, adding another layer um, onto uh, both the responsibility of the BCC and to the uh, licensees or applicants, uh, I think just becomes slightly over overly bureaucratic um, and creates a lot of additional work for folks. Um, you know, one of the things that we might make as a, a recommendation to staff is just that as, they're go as the li new licensees or applicants are going through this process, they be given a list of those, you know, requirements and resources out there to make sure that they are, they understand are in, and are in compliance but requiring them to create a whole plan around this, I, I feel it's a, a little bit uh, um, uh, unnecessary. And frankly, if you're you know, a legitimate business in the state of California and you have employees and you're violating labor practices, then you're opening yourself up to a litigation. Um, so you know, that, that whole process is there. That industry takes care of itself. Um, and, and arguably, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a new industry in the state of California, at least uh, on the legitimate side. But you know, every time a new business or a new, you know, company opens up in, in California, we don't uh, provide this additional layer uh, to them and, and force them to recognize uh, labor practices because, frankly, they already know about it. Um, and if you're going to not operate in the state of California, you have to be in compliance. So perhaps just, you know, like I say, a list of resources and requirements that the BCC could provide uh, business owners at the onset um, so that they're aware and could be in compliance. And it includes all the way down through, you know, sexual harassment and other issues, just so everybody is aware. Um, and, you know, again, any business that's operating in the state of California has to have those sheets, you know, laminated in the back office where all the employees can have access to all of the, you know, regulatory requirements and, you know, notifications and, you know, uh, uh, if they want to report something. So I'm not sure we uh, necessarily need to do this. Um, any other comments from the members? <coughs> All right, we have a motion. Chairman, I have a couple of comments. Oh, Mr. Bobulian. Uh, so a couple of things on this. The labor standards really apply to two, uh, two sides. You've got the health and safety of the employees. Then you also have the wage and hour and the pay that the employees are going to be receiving. On the health and the safety aspect of it, I think we have enough agencies like OSHA and all that where you just have to comply with it. Um, even without a union agreement or neutrality agreement. And if you're in violation of it, you have a lot more problems to worry about than uh, the unions. On the pay side, um, employees in this industry are not getting paid what they should be getting paid, what they deserve to be getting paid. If you look at the general side of it, um, if the average employee is making 30, 40,000 a year, and if you've got 10 employees, 20 employees, you've got an $800,000 a year uh, payroll burden, your benefits that you're going to be providing is about 20% of that. So if you've got 800000 in payroll that you're already paying, you're, you're doing pretty good as a business, an extra 160000 that goes to the benefit of your employees is money well spent and it should be spent, considering um, um, all the money that everyone's talking about uh, making in this industry. So on that side, I agree with a couple of um, clarifications. On the neutrality agreements, when you sign the neutrality agreements and it doesn't necessarily mean you're tied to the union, you're connected with the union. It means that when you do get your license and you are operational, you're not going to prevent the union from speaking with your employees and um, discussing with them the possibility of them uh, entering into a collective bargain agreement or in joining the union. If they elect to join the union, the dues that they pay comes from the employee's pocket, not from the employer's pocket, so financially it's not a burden on the employer. 
On the small business side, the small farmer side, it does create a financial burden on them, um, and that's on the benefit side. On the bigger corporation side, if that's a concern, it does create a burden on them because for all intents and purposes, generally speaking, it does take away the at-will status of the employee, and California is an at-will state. Now, it is important to also note that generally, it does not include managers, supervisors, and uh, those types of employees, which are usually your higher, uh, higher salaried employees. So on the regulations, we have enough regulations to cover it. On the pay stuff, I think it is something that we do need as an industry. It is to protect the employees. It is, it's 100% almost, it's almost targeted for the benefit of the employees. So it's important to weigh that out, whether it's being done for the wages and the pay and the opportunity for the employees, or is it being done for the health and safety side of it? Because the health and safety side, like I said before, we do have enough agencies that do already provide that oversight. If you are in violation of everything, you have a lot more to worry about. Okay, any others? All right, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Pavilion. Aye. Cermak. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. No. Farrow. Point of clarification, is this vote to separate the, the items or is this in favor of the motion that was originally made? No, the motion is to adopt recommendation number one, labor standards. Then it's aye. Harada. Nay. Jacobson. Nay. Leff. Nay. Lynch. Aye. Nevada. Nay. Nikita. Yes. Nikita. Yes. Peck. Nay. Ron. Nay. Stevenson. Nay. Todd. Aye. Williams. Nay. Woolsey. Nay. Wu. Nay. You. Aye. Motion fails. All right, calm down. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, recommendation number two. Uh, can we get a uh, motion and second on recommendation number two, please? I move to adopt recommendation number two. All right, do we have a second? Second. Woolsey. All right, uh, motion by Wu, second by Woolsey. Any comment from members? Does this include public corporations? Well, my understanding was it does. Uh, can you clarify the uh, public corporation aspect? Uh, yes. So if recommendation number two, if the applicant lists a corporation as an owner, then they would have to disclose the name of the owners of the owner or owners of the corporation. And does the owner, uh, the definition of an owner go with the Bureau's definition of an owner of 20% or above? Yes, sir. Aggregate? Yes. Any other comments, questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we do a roll call vote, please? Boboyan. Aye. Cermak. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Harada. Aye. Jacobson. Nay. Leff. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevidal. Aye. Nikita. Aye. Peck. Aye. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Aye. Todd. Aye. Williams. Aye. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. You. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, can we get a uh, motion and second on recommendation number three, please? I move recommend. I move that we adopt recommendation number three. And do we have a second? I'll oh, second. Okay. Uh, motion by Miss Yu, second by Mr. Leff. Any other comment or discussion? Uh, I have a. I have a question about the disclosure of the addresses that was brought up by public comment. It doesn't. 
uh, doesn't seem necessary to disclose addresses and other personal information to the general public. Is, it, is that addressed in there? I was under the understanding that this application would just directly go to the Bureau. None of this information would be made available to the public, strictly to the state. Sure, I can clarify. So depending on the information that comes to the Bureau, some of it's disclosable, some of it's not. And it, so we, um, we take a look at that whenever we get a request for information. Uh, question, is it possible to make it exempt from FOIA? Freedom of Information Act? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're, we're subject to FOIA. We're also subject to the California Public Records Act. The only way to be exempted from that um, specifically would be by statutory change. Uh, I have a question. Um, so it's a state-issued government ID. Does this put, um, you know, a lot of these businesses are run by families who employ family members. Uh, d does this put people at risk who um, whose immigration status may be unknown? Theoretically, it's possible, but this the recommendation is directed at corporations. Um, to kind of add something to that, on the foreign status stuff, cannabis is still a federally scheduled uh, one drug, so it is a deportable offense, and the disclosures. Um, touch on something else. It's important to understand the implications of this one. It's being done targeting the bigger corporations. I completely understand that. But at the same time, this state, the operators are going to need access to capital. On the fi in the finance world, it's not difficult to get around stuff like this. It's not difficult to come up with straw people. Not that it's legal, but it's not difficult. I, my concern is that we're creating a situation where it's encouraging people to circumvent the regulations and the statutes because on the business side you've got this discussion already started with the US already falling behind as an industry to um, Canada to the UK and other places like that this discourages even more money from entering the space on an even more important level um, to touch on social equity social equity we need to come up with funding for it. We need to be able to create an opportunity for funding to be uh, available for that. One of the ways you're going to be able to do that on a very large scale is private equity funds. It's family offices. It's, it's all of the above. It's public corporations. I know of at least three entities that are trying to establish and set it up and seed it and create that fund. This is going to, stuff like this is going to prevent it because way it's going to be extremely difficult if not impossible to get a public company to list all their owners and have them all submit their driver's licenses and all that stuff. You have a lot of investors, finance people that wanted to enter the space. They have all the best intentions in the world uh, to enter the space. Stuff like this is going to prevent them from entering the space. As far as uh, operators are concerned, the money becomes not available. So. I mean, look, you got debt instruments, you got convertible notes, you've got SPVs, uh, special purpose vehicles. It's not going to be difficult to hide interest. I think the more regulations that goes um, and targets and creates um, a necessity to disclose them, I think that just creates an opportunity for the organizations to get creative and fancy and circumvent them. So those are just my general comments on this one. I have a question on, um, it was a, a question posed by a member of the public and it came up um, when you were speaking. Uh, Section 5004 talks about financial interest in a commercial cannabis business and under C4 it talks about individuals who hold a share of stock that is less than 5% of the total shares in a publicly traded company. Um, those people are excluded from being listed on the application. Um, is that in any way in conflict with this recommendation? I think there was a comment if I own any share of a stock, you know, 
that I would have to disclose, but I think if you only if you have more than 5%, you would have to disclose. Is that, I, I'm just curious about how that interacts with this recommendation. Right, so the, ra the regulations right now is currently drafted. If you own less than 5% of a publicly traded company, you would not have to disclose under the financial interest disclosures. Um, and that's consistent, my understanding is, it's consistent with that percentage um, that's required for your SAC filings. Okay, so if this, if this recommendation went through, the list of people would still exclude those people who have less than 5% interest so if right so the way I'm reading this recommendation is to change the, the, the committees considering whether or not to change the way that the financial interest is currently drafted to give you guys a specific example on this um, in New York one of the companies that was uh, that ended up having to bow out of the process was one mentioned by name but they're one of the bigger companies nationwide where all they do is work with children um, out of Colorado because of the public company disclosure and not being able to get all the shareholders to submit their fingerprints and their driver's licenses, they have to bow out. And that's one of the companies that's doing it right. That's one of the companies where it's 100% about the kids. So they were prevented from entering to New York simply because of uh, this exact uh, type of a disclosure. To step away from the public company where you're dealing with shares and aggregates of 5% or more, uh, with the private equity structure, that's not a public company. That's more of a limited partner, general partner situation. The definition of owner uh, um, in the state of 20%, majority of the time, generally speaking, your general partners do make up about 20%. Your limited partners make up uh, 80%. But it's the general, it's the limited partners that would, if you were to uh, compare them, would be the equivalent of your public uh, company shareholders. A lot of times these guys own more than 5%, it's lower than 5%, but the definition of a public company ownership, 5% aggregate, would not apply to a private equity structure, and the money available the majority of the time is private equity money, family offices and stuff like that, and convertible debt. So the public company aspect is one side of it, but there's the equivalent of it on the other side, which does get into trouble with the structure. Right, and just for a clarification there, right now the regulations exempt people, that 5%, this recommendation doesn't does not limit a percentage. Okay, thank you, that, that helps. This is Nikita, may I? Um, not to belabor this point, I mean, we've been discussed this at length already, but my understanding is that section 26051.5 of uh, the BPC uh, subsection D already requires that if you have a financial interest in the company, you must be Disclose with some exemptions as provided in regulation. So, if you if you have a financial interest in a company that has a financial interest in another company, you're still required to disclose under that statute. Is that correct? Statute requires anybody with a financial interest. So this would this recommendation as drafted would. I mean, the staff's response is we're, we're clarifying that if you pass this recommendation, we would add, we would also require that the company itself be listed as somebody, as a person with a financial interest, correct? That is correct. Okay, so the, the, way, I, the way I read this recommendation is that it's actually more limited than, dra than it's drafted, but simply would say if you're a company and you, own a and you have a financial interest in, in another company, that company's name needs to be disclosed, and everybody who owns a piece of that company already needs to be disclosed under statute. I think that's what I'm hearing from council. Yes, so the regulations would be amended just to clarify that point. Okay, so, so I think with that clarification, I'm comfortable with this. All, all, all it's saying is that everybody already needs to be disclosed. If you're a warm body, you, you need to be disclosed if you have a financial interest with some limitation, but now we're saying, if you're a company, we also want to know the company's name. Yes, we just want to get down to the owner if there's a corporation that that's, um, has a financial interest. So just as clarification to that point, we heard public comment regarding um, concerns and in support of number two in that we didn't want shell companies to be kind of coming in and basically, you know, posing, you know, having a shell company. So what... Um, 
uh, Nikita's comments are responsive and, and do address that issue that was made public comment about shell companies being disclosed? That was our intent, yes, of the subcommittee. So with that, now you see a lot of, see the first, the recommendation number two, disclosure of owners, if, you have, if you've layered it with a couple of LLCs, a couple of corporations, at one point you get to an owner. The difference in recommendation two and recommendation three is now recommendation three goes to the specific interest holders of those corporations, be it a shell, be it a third layer, be it a fourth layer. Now you, I would say, what do you do in a situation with legacy trust and phantom stock? And that's where you're creating that opportunity where it's like, okay, if everyone's got to be disclosed, great. Now it's a legacy trust. Now it's, a fa it's uh, the stock that's issued is phantom stock. You're not going to be able to get around that. And that's where I'm trying to uh, get to this. And your point's well taken. Um, this is our first step to addressing this issue. And clearly there's more concerns. Um, but this is just the first step to make sure that corporations or any entity that's trying to go around the process, at least it's the you know, first piece of uh, transparency measure that they'll have to uh, figure out. Thank you. Yes. So I have a question, I guess, for counsel. Is, um, would it be possible to move, if a motion was so made and adopted, to move this to a future meeting for discussion? Or are we limited because of the um, process and the subcommittee process? Because I think there's a lot of questions. I have questions of my own. It seems mm -hmm. that the committee has questions. And so um, for number two and three, which are quite connected, I'm just wondering if we, um, if it would be at all in order to even propose that that be moved to a further meeting. So, sorry. So the agenda allows you to consider and discuss and take action. So you could take action. Um, well, actually, recommendation number two has already been addressed through through a vote. Um, but you could the action could be to consider it at a future meeting. Um, at this point, though, I think it would be a full committee meeting because I don't believe that the chairs extended the subcommittees beyond the initial sessions. So um, that would be an option um, if someone wanted to make that motion. I think there's a different motion pending right now, though. question about the motion pending. So um, w I'm trying to understand what exactly you're addressing. What, what, would a go, what would a go around look like that isn't currently addressed in the regulations? I think you would be addressing what Mr. Babolian had originally mentioned any of the family trusts or any of the other potential workarounds that entities could be seeking. So is the concern that a family trust in that the public or the BCC needs to know if a family trust invests in a business? Is that, is that the concern? That there would be some, inve some investor that uh, the BCC that the BCC needs to know about every investment entity in a business? The way it's drafted right now, it's corporation or other entity. So I'm not sure if that catches everything, but I would hope that catches what you're referring to more. I'm just trying to understand what the concern is. What, what's the concern in not listing? What's the concern with the regulations as they stand now? What's the, what's the worry that you're trying to address? The worry is that we have a some type of big consolidated business with a financial in, with many financial investors who may be corporations or other entities just feeding money into the company and we want to at least make sure there's some transparency there so the state when processing the application has the the information on who the actual um, owners are of the corporation or other entity. Dr. Cermak, I'm curious as to whether or not there are any additional complications in applying this to foreign corporations. So the way the regulations are drafted now, it 
the obligations to disclose a financial interest apply to everybody, corporations going back or individuals. And so um, I think the staff response suggests we could, you know, clarify that maybe in the language because I think some people don't necessarily understand that it's any, the statute requires any person with a financial interest and person under the statute is a person, corporation, limited liability company, basically any sort of structure. In terms of foreign corporations, there's no prohibition against a foreign corporation having an interest. However, they're still, as owners of the license or having an interest in the license, regardless of where that corporation resides, it's still subject to the same rules as an owner that anyone else would be um, under that license in the state of California. How would this affect, for example, uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding? <laughs> the statute currently... The statute currently requires the um, disclosure of anyone with a financial interest that meets that threshold. No. Um, for the financial interest under the statute, it's any financial interest. There's no percentage. The percentage only comes into play for ownership, that 20%, to be an actual owner. The statute's specifically for financial interest. It's any financial interest, but there are a few exceptions like the blind trust and, of course, we have the publicly traded company if you're below that 5% threshold. Any others? All right, I'd, I'd have to agree with uh, Mr. Babulian on this one. If we, you know, overregulate again, start to put ourselves in the position of, of requesting all this additional information, you know, these companies are going to be traded and, and uh, changes are going to happen. So now we're creating this, I think, a fairly onerous uh, burden on, on the BCC and the staff to be able to keep track and the businesses themselves be able to keep track of all of these folks. You know, I think the the regulations as staff uh, had had prepared originally probably meet a lot of the requirements and and, and candidly you know look uh, you know again we're in the very uh, uh, early stages of all this if if we're you know down the road in this you know 12 months 18 months from now and we see that there's a lot of folks coming to again these public hearings and commenting and saying you know look uh, you know, uh, Corporation X is, uh, you know, pr producing all these shell corporations to, you know, uh, enter the industry, but, but silently, um, you know, then we, we can deal with that at that point. But uh, right now, I think, you know, the, the, the regs as uh, proposed uh, are at least a good step forward without becoming too burdensome and risking the, uh, the, the, the cost at the end of, of pushing out a lot of investors that might have an interest, but have a lot of concerns legally or otherwise. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, call for the vote. Babulian. Nay. Cermak. Aye. Clifford. Nay. Dombrowski. No. Farrow. Aye. Harada. Harada. Nay. Jacobson. Nay. Leff. Nay. Lynch. Aye. Nevidal. Nay. Nikita. Aye. Peck. Nay. Ron. Nay. Stevenson. Nay. Todd. Aye. Williams. Nay. Woolsey. Nay. Wu. Nay. You. Aye. Motion fails. Yeah. Okay, moving on to uh, recommendation number six. Can we get a uh, motion and second for recommendation six, please? I recommend, or I move recommendation number six. For approval. All right. Do we have a second? No, I'll second. All right. Uh, we have a motion. Can, Can we, we just uh, clarify that the motion was to adopt recommendation number six? Is that correct? Yes, I okay. move to adopt recommendation number six. Thank you. Thank you. And that's what you understood you seconded, correct? That's correct. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any comment? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and uh, do the roll call vote. Bobolian. Abstained out of conflict. Cermak. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Her Aye. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Leff. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevidal. Abstain. 
Nikita? Aye. Peck? Aye. Ron? Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Todd? Aye. Williams? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. Let's move on and, and keep these separate still. Uh, let's deal with uh, recommendation number four, annual fees. Uh, report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The recommendation is that the licensing authorities should evaluate the amount of annual fees, especially fees paid by people with disabilities and military veterans. Staff comments, Business and Professions Code sections 26012 and 26180 as set provide for the collection of fees, including the requirement to establish a fee scale based on the size of the business that covers the cost of enforcement and administration. The licensing authorities are not required to levy a specific fee and could explore different fees as needed. This came out of discussion in our committee that the annual licensing costs are high and can pose barriers to entry. In our discussion, we recognize the need to reduce annual licensing fees for protected groups. We also recognize the need to reduce fees for formerly incarcerated individuals and equity programs, which at the time we didn't want to duplicate the work of the equity subcommittee. Um, so our subcommittee ended, landed on this recommendation as a starting point. Since we are still missing the equity portion, I would like to include this moving forward in our discussion. So I move we amend the recommendation to include locally licensed equity applicants. I'll okay. second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any, let's start with. Uh, you can't amend the recommendation, but you can make a motion. Different recommendation. Okay, can you, okay, so let's, let's start over here for just a moment. You can't um, change the recommendation, but you can amend your motion. Oh, okay. Um, what was the motion on the table to to discuss the recommendation? I think you made a motion to, um, my understanding was to adopt number four, but you wanted to amend the subcommittee's recommendation. You can't do that, but you can certainly make a recommendation that, uh, make a motion that recommendation num number four be adopted with whatever, oh, okay. with whatever you're going to propose in your motion for amendments. Okay. I move to adopt recommendation number four with the amendment to include locally licensed equity applicants. And I'll still second it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, let's start uh, with the uh, committee first. Any questions of Ms. Yu or her uh, committee members? Nikita. So I just said, I, I support the recommendation. I just have a comment though that when the, um, th this is not an amendment to, the, to anything, but if this passes and the Bureau does go back and the other licensing agencies go back and look at the fees that they look closely, not just at who is applying, but, but what, what is the business that they are applying for. Uh, and I'll just give an example. Um, there's legislation currently pending right now, AB 2762, that defines disabled uh, veteran-owned businesses. It defines social enterprise businesses. These are businesses that are, are certified green or they uh, employ formerly incarcerated, formerly homeless. These are the types of businesses I think should be receiving uh, reduced fees or incentivized fees. Um, and I think the Bureau and the other licensing agencies should look more at those types of categories when they look at um, incentivizing fees. Any others? All right, let's go ahead and move to public comment, please. All right, so we'll start with speaker number one. Susan Tibben, legacy farmers are dealing with over 30 agencies right now. Aggregated fees are now approaching $100,000. In rural Mendocino County, all businesses are seeing up to 75% diminution in sales. Our county is at 1% adoption, and without adoption by legacy farmers, our communities are just, they're falling apart financially and socially. Uh, legacy farmers need incentives and fees tied to gross receipts and a protocol which serves us who laid the groundwork for generations for this newly legalized industry. Right now, present adoption serves well-capitalized entity entities. We small farmers do not qualify for any commercial instruments. 
nor do we medicine makers offer huge dividends to investors. So please, tie fees to gross receipts to create some space for us. Thank you. Speaker number two. Hello, my name is Joshua Jenkins. I'm with Loyal Penguin Incorporated. At Loyal Penguin, our mission is to improve the lives of American veterans. So I come to you today to first request that the veteran piece be drawn out of this recommendation and be a recommendation in and of itself. There is already equity treatment on the books for the state of California that the Bureau of Cannabis Control's attorneys continue to deny and ignore. Hiding behind the fact that the codification of it is placed into a county um, code book. This code was in place before that code book existed. 1901 Business and Professions Code 16102 was placed into effect. 1941 was the last amendment to that. And I don't understand why the state continues to deny the actual equity that veterans have already been afforded. This is on the books. Yet I'm sitting here being ignored from this bureau's attorneys and all these veterans, this should have been put into effect when we looked at the emergency regulations. 11 Business and Professions Code, Section 115.4, for the expedited application processing by honorably discharged veterans was included. But obviously, the money involved with helping the veteran community and affording the equity that veterans are entitled by law was overlooked when your, when your bureau cared more about the money on application processing than the actual people deserving the equity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Speaker three. Well, that's a tough act to follow. I'm Paul Hansberry. <laughs> um, and... Um, I agree with the chair that this is not a new industry. This has been around for a very long time. Uh, it's just newly legalized. Uh, there should be incentives for adoption, and there's all, all we're getting is barriers. The fees, as uh, the speaker number one suggested, should be tied to gross receipts. Out of the gate, perhaps your, your estimated gross receipts. This is new territory in this new legalized uh, industry, uh, but the small farmer Everything that we're talking about here is about corporate. It's about large businesses. The small farmer, the legacy farmers, are going to be turned to dust. I came in here today, and um, I'll, we'll be speaking later on, but it looks like we're not going to be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to speaker number one. Dr. William Norman Munjar, retired military veteran, I will honor you to say that you have expediated my application as a veteran. I do not believe in the comments necessarily of others that say that you have not provided that for veterans. You have. You have expediated mine under your uh, program and I have received my temporary license. Thank you very much from the veterans of the United States Army. On these annual fees, now I am an independent owner of my company for event organizer license. You have set fees. For me, at some point, you're going to ask me for $5,000 for five events or $10,000 for unlimited events. I ask, is there any event organizer, wedding, church, or otherwise that are being charged $10,000 to conduct these activities? Mm -hmm. I find that these fees, whoever set them, are astronomical and without insight. How can a retired military veteran independently raise these monies without going to corporate? Now, on corporate, Corporate, when they come in, maybe they won't poison the pesticides. Maybe they won't poison. I test 100 of these legion groups in Northern California for pesticides. 95% are contaminated. The mom and pops are using the poison. The corporate may come in and streamline. Do not always think that corporate is evil. They can bring in and stabilize this economy and assist us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker number two. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? To, to the people no, speaking? Uh, no, I'm Do sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Douglas Rio, and I'm the program director for the East Bay Canada Compassion Program. I'm also representing the California Compassion Coalition. Um, thank you for considering annual fees. We'd also, the coalition would like to request that compassion programs be considered under uh, this evaluation. In the impacted regulation section 5014, in determining the appropriate license fees, um, B2 
be charged, the estimated max, maximum value of the product is determined, quote, by assessing the 15% excise tax. And as the CDTFA has announced, they are not applying the, C, the excise tax to donated cannabis. 100% of the programs in the coalition use and, and deliver 100% donated cannabis products. So our max value is zero. So we are asking the committee to consider the following. Uh, the CCC recommendation is that non-renumeration compassion cannabis activities and programs donating 100% of the organization's cannabis at no cost to qualified at-risk communities should be fully exempted from all state taxes and fees. I should also note we've, we've uh, put together a memo that has been delivered. There's copies for all of you stating our positions and all the recommendations being discussed today. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. <clears throat> yes, uh, Ray Purs again. Um, on the equity side, um, we've been bringing this up several times in all of these meetings. And everybody around here knows that African Americans and people of color have been devastated with the war on drugs. Many of my brothers and sisters are in prison right now for selling weed. And I see by linking everybody else, and I'll have a problem with everybody else, but by linking them in with, well, you know, us being linking, linked with them as, as an equity application, I think is doing for a disservice. Uh, so I would have the committee seriously look at setting aside or coming up with some priority for African Americans and, 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 and folks of color that will advance them uh, uh, through this because I don't think any other group uh, was hit hard by the wall on drugs than African Americans. So I would recommend on the fee side that you specifically look at African Americans, minority, I mean, African Americans and, and, and individuals of color because of the devastation that happened in our community and continues to happen in our community. As a matter of fact, some don't even want to come to this part because of not getting the information uh, in their community. You're not going in our community. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to speaker one. Hello, good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Ryan Miller of Operation EVAC, educating veterans about cannabis. And we're also members of the California Compassion Coalition. Uh, thank you for recommending that veterans uh, don't pay annual fees or reduced fees. And I'd just like to tell you why. Uh, because most of the folks in this room got about four to 20 years a head start, right? Going to universities, establishing your businesses, getting experience, while those of us that serve spill the blood of our enemies and the blood of our comrades so that you can do this. So this entire consumption, capitalist, Babylonian existence wouldn't even be here without those of us that wore the uniform. I do want to caution you about reducing the qualification to disabled veterans or even for compassion to limit that to disabled veterans. We're only about 4% of the population. We're not going to be this big overwhelming force that just disrupts the whole community. What you have here is an opportunity to legitimately welcome home troops, provide a sustainable employment and equity, uh, and let's, let's reduce suicide together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaker two. My name is Ramon Garcia. I'm on the board of Social Justice and Equity for the California Growers Association. I've been speaking for equity in the state for the last three years, and specifically in regards to access to capital and equity programs are great, but without the resources and the capital behind it, these equity programs are going to fail. And that, that specifically goes to these laws coming up. They, they pushed it on, on the end of trying to disrupt or, or help fix what the war on drugs did, the communities, colors, and, and, and equity applicants. So having scholarships, fee waivers, payment plans, reduce fees for this community is very vital because it's hard enough for us to come up with the capital to start our business, be compliant, get real estate, and then on top of that to have all these fees for the small farmers, they're included in this equity, small businesses, 
we're the ones that fought for hard for the legalization. We're the ones that put our lives and our properties at risk for this legalization, and we're the ones being kept out and specifically in large portion to all the local fees and then on top of that the state fees that are being charged to these businesses just to start. Most of us have had to shut down our businesses because of the, the licensing structure and because we can't come in compliant, because we can't compete, because most of the bigger corporation businesses have already changed their compliance to, to eliminate us from competition. So. Thank you. All right, speaker number three. I'd like to share my experiences with regards to fees, fees that are incurred before even getting to the point of state licensing. As a local uh, indoor, specialty indoor and type seven extractor permittee, I had to get a business license with a local use permit. I had to get a plumbing, mechanical, electrical, structural engineering plan created, all with individual permit costs. I had to register my business with the Alameda County Department of Environmental Hazard and submit a permit fee to them. I had to submit my business to, this, to the uh, San Francisco Bay Conservation District and had a building fee with them. I had to report to the Port of Oakland, which also had a building fee. I had to report to the Oakland Fire Prevention Bureau for a permit fee for CO2 storage. I had to report to the Oakland Fire Prevention Bureau for an additional permit fee for CO2 use and enrichment. I had to apply for a third permit with the Fire Prevention Bureau for LPG storage tanks and use. I had to provide, uh, pr apply for an additional permit to using flammable fluids. 90 seconds is not even enough for me to get to the state agriculture, the state department of health, and so forth and so on. So when we talk about fees, 90 seconds is not enough time for me to list the number of fees and permits that I've had to apply for just to get to the point of state licensure. Not, not even discussing how Oakland's strong arming me and completing my punch card to get my state permit. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, speaker one. Uh, Tim Moreland, River Distributing. Uh, just give you the, the, the annual license and fees um, per, from the perspective of a statewide distributor. Um, this is a huge state. It's, it's a nation. Uh, you need multiple locations to really fulfill statewide distribution around the state. Each location requires an A and an M license. And the gross and the actual fee for the annual license is the same on each location. So it's two license fees per location. So as you can imagine, that adds up. Uh, in support of this recommendation because um, I guess you're gonna evaluate what these fees look like and I would urge you when you're evaluating what the fees look like to consider industry operators with multiple locations in the state and then maybe do some type of tier fee for you know a separate location. Maybe there's a primary location, you pay the full fee, um, and then maybe lower fees on other additional locations throughout the state. This is gonna be a huge issue for statewide distributors. Thank you for your support of this motion. Thank you, all right, speaker two. Hi there, Alan Steiner with Green Rush Consulting. Um, as far as the fees go, I think the fact that we're having this conversation at all is inspiring. Um, I think that the recommendations that have already been made about uh, veterans and uh, minority businesses, um, I think that the other area that I would love to see the opportunity to be, to be bringing into this conversation are people with uh, cannabis-related arrests on their record. Um, another one being uh, anybody who can prove that they were operating a business under Prop 215. I don't know how you go about doing that. I don't think that we have a list. I think that is a problem. Um, I think that uh, the other thing is uh, when, I, when people come to me asking how much it's going to cost to start a business, uh, I tell them that it's about $150,000 of pure risk involved in just finding out if you can even get the license in the first place. Um, if those numbers don't make sense to you, why it costs that much to get through the consulting process, to pay the architects, to get the security consultant, to figure out, to get through the, the compliance uh, consultations, please do your homework and talk to consultants, figure out why the costs are what they are, because this is a very high capital industry to get into, and once you get into the industry, it's very high risk. Um, so the annual fees are an area where we can actually um, give some advantages to those people who we really do want to see participating in this industry. I think that we all agree about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, speaker three. Ralph Trueblood. 
Uh, I'm the chairperson of the board of the WAM uh, Collective in Santa Cruz. I am on a member of the California Compassion Coalition and uh, uh, was executive director of the now dormant uh, Bay Area Advocates for Medical Marijuana. A uh, couple of, uh, couple of uh, points that I'm going to make are uh, uh, pancreatitis sufferer, I'll give her initials AO, spent 300 days in the hospital in 1997 when I met uh, her she, and provided her with uh, medical cannabis. She, uh, the following year, spent zero days in the hospital and has not spent one day in the hospital due to her pancreatitis. Uh, subsequently, uh, patient uh, quadriplegic uh, LC averaged 10 days in the hospital every year and subsequent to his beginning using medical cannabis has spent zero days in the hospital. I just want to point out that uh, I and the rest of the people who are working with compassionate use uh, have saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 20 years, 22 years since uh, Proposition 215 was passed. And we don't need any more impediments. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to move up to Speaker 1. Hi, my name is Sean Kernan of the Weed Warriors Project. Uh, we obviously have a very long way to go. Uh, but my veterans and our veterans would like to say thank you for starting this dialogue from the last conversation. The BCC reached out and we see here that you're taking it seriously, so we would like to say thank you. Uh, with regards to uh, a couple comments made previously, I would just speak. Uh, veterans represent all demographics in this country, uh, but mostly they come from poverty. It's the best economic opportunity that they have. So they're not mutually exclusive with pretty much most of the social equity demographics out there. Thanks so much. Speaker two. Good morning and welcome. I, I appreciate being here. I'm a little nervous. First time I've done this coming out. My name is Christopher King. I am a military veteran. I just retired from 24 years, one month and 11 days, about four years ago. Whereupon I started using the California veterans guidebook that is handed out that as a recruiter I handed out to people and told them these are the benefits you will receive when you get out of the military. I started going through this and I can tell you I've gotten every single one of them thus far that I was qualified to do until I got to the business license tax and fee exemption. The business license tax and fee exemption benefits exempts eligible veterans from municipal, county, and state businesses, license fees, taxes, and other fees. The exemption applies to veterans who hawk, peddle, and vend any goods and wares, and that's a really good name for a business, I think. Um, <laughs> my veterans accept all of the things alcohol related, which I understand because nobody died from cannabis today. I can't tell you how many people died from alcohol. Um, who's eligible? Veterans. How do we bring it? You walk in with the provided documents. Very simple, it's a lot. I can't understand why I'm having to talk about this today. I really can't. Um, you go down, property tax, got it. I think the disconnect is with the Disabled Veterans Business Enterprise Program. That is a so different entity. We're not going to be able to bid on state contracts because you're not doing anything with cannabis at the state level yet. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker three. I have a canned speech. The reason being is because I want to stand under my 90 seconds. Dear distinguished board members, I come to you as an African American man, born, raised, and reared in this great city of Oakland. Yet, I am astonished that we have not addressed the mass incarceration of the people of color and the war on drugs, and leveling out the playing field of this new economy. My family has served and died for this country since the Civil War, protecting the freedoms of others and ensuring that all can live and be granted the prosperity of this great country. As mentioned before, we have yet to address amnesty for those who paved the way of this new economy. Additionally, those people of color who attempt to participate and suffer the economic hardships of not having the generational wealth to participate, but having to accept the words of my Native American brothers, whiskey deals or beads for large portions of their businesses, I implore you to do something with revenue that you collect 
and give back to those who desperately need it. The unfair taxation, regulations, and laws are setting up barriers for those obstacles for people of color. So once again, I implore you to do something about taxation as well as some of the laws and regulations. So once again, I thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to speaker one. Hi, Nolan Moy from Saratech Corp. I agree with the recommendation of the committee to decrease the fees of disproportionately members of the community in addition to eliminating the A&M individual annual fees because we don't have sales data for the first year as we've seen from the projections of our fees and taxes collected in our first quarter have been dramatically lower than we expected. We should wait until we have further data to assess these arbitrarily set fees. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dale Sky Jones of Oaksterdam University. First, I just want to thank you for your time and attention and being here. Um, I want to address uh, events and yearly uh, charges because I don't know where else to put us. No one's talking about it, and that's education. I am trying to continue education in this state. Yeah, you can applaud education. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'll take the time. Uh, we've educated over 35,000 students from over 40 countries now, and we've brought them mostly here to California. Uh, to pay the extra hotel taxes and uh, shop in our shops and our neighbors. So this is also an economic play that I'm making here. I'm not the only educator out there, nor am I trying to be. I do believe there should be a threshold, but there needs to be a division with respect to events as to the nature of events. Is this a smoke out? Or are we trying to educate people on proper policy and law and do so in a way that is affordable and accessible? We already give a huge percentage of our classes away to veterans, to people that are disadvantaged. We need to be able to continue to do so because our money does not grow on trees. And we have to have a place for education. So I implore you, whether it's an education and research or a division under events, but I implore you to please realize that the only way I can continue to give these scholarships to focus on disadvantaged people, events in the community, is to find a place for us. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we're going to move to speaker three. Hello, and thank you for coming today. My name is Ron Leggett, and I represent Route 64 in Chiefing Manufacturing, and I'm also, also an Oakland Equity applicant and also an Oaksterdam alumni. Um, as a first-generation urban Native American, I do not have the generational wealth, and I find it very difficult to enter the, the legal industry. By lowering the fees for people of color and other equity applicants, I believe it will allow more people of color and equity applicants who have been targeted by the war on drugs to enter the cannabis industry. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm Charlie Pappas. I'm a cannabis commissioner in Berkeley and also co-founder and uh, um, ch former chairman of Divinity Tree uh, San Francisco Dispensary, the first one closed by Melinda Haig. I want to thank this commission for listening. I, I hope you're paid better than our commission because you, you have a lot ahead of you. Uh, so much eloquence before me. I just want to briefly say, uh, you know, to remind you of that you have several uh, gorillas in the room and in the state to deal with. Uh, the number one one for me, I would say, is inclusion of the, of the, you know, the 40 years of businesses. Also, uh, also um, the private co-ops and collectives, they don't seem to be dealt with by the state. I'm all for corporations as long as they're you know, doing it the right way and, and you know, uh, not shutting out other people. And the underground market, you have to, you have to deal with that. You have, to, you, you have to get these people involved somehow. And uh, I thank you for your work and listening. Thank you. All right, we'll move to speaker three. Yeah, hi, my name is Robert Wiener. Um, I own a uh, CO2 manufacturing uh, company up in Humboldt County. And the fees are what's being discussed now. And as everybody else has already enunciated, the fees are really hard, but they're, they're actually also being especially hard on the small farmers which which are dependent upon this uh, beautiful plant to uh, make a living with and there's three three generations of farmers up there that are just selling out their properties they're not going to be able to make make their fees they're not going to be able to make their taxes there's a cultivation tax that is extremely uh, prohibitive to a lot of the farmers and in the last week we've had seven of our neighbors that have quit just decided they've gone almost all the way through this process, including temporary fees, but once they got to the part where they were going to have to 
uh, also pay the cultivation. They call it a tax, but it's really a fee. And I see no other industry in, uh, uh, in agriculture that has this type of fees attached to it. So I would appreciate if you were also address that at some point. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. I think Speaker 2 is next. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Adam Villarreal. I am a military veteran. I also work with a firm who's currently trying to do the tier three side of the social equity partnership. Um, I just wanted to express my appreciation to the committee for addressing these concerns. Um, as you heard from some of the other speakers, the, the weight of the fees on the small farmer and some of the other social equity applicants is very onerous and it provides a lot of hardship. One thing that I wanted to address that hadn't brought up is including tier three uh, applicants as well into the alleviation of these fees. If you're going out and you're trying to support a partnership and sponsor one of these social equity applicants, why then should you also be subject to some of these fees going in? Like, does that not also apply to people who are out there trying to do the good work, make these partnerships, and help push the social equity program forward? Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaker one. My name is Travis Wheatley. I'm CAO of Loyal Penguin, and I'm um, also spokesman for Vega Veterans Alliance for Government Accountability. I'd like to take the time to read S Section 16.102, and it is, Every soldier, sailor, or Marine of the United States who has received an honorable discharge or release from active duty under honorable conditions from such service may hawk, pedal, and vend any good wares or merchandise owed to him except spirituous malts, venice, or other intoxicating liquors without payment of any license, tax, or fee whatsoever, whether municipal, county, or state, and the Board of Supervisors shall issue to such soldier, sailor, or marine without cost a license, therefore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker three. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Cook. I'm the general manager of the Mushroom Farm out in Pescadero, a uh, compliance space for uh, cannabis operations. Um, I would just like to encourage us to do everything we can to um, really eliminate fees and costs to all of the smallest license types out there. And I'm not knowledgeable enough to be able to be more specific than that, but I think it's the small people that we're trying to help out. The larger license types, I think, could subsidize uh, this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaker one. Uh, David Fluhart. Um, so overall, we're looking at like the big conglomerate swallowing these poor, small legacy farmers behind us. And um, unfortunately, this is just a cannabis advisory committee and hopefully you guys really, really push to the legislature and to the BCC that, that there is required an equity ad, uh, advocacy or, or equity uh, amnesty type program and uh, really push the legislature on this because quite honestly, I don't think they're going to listen to you. I think they're just in their own little room doing whatever the heck they want and you guys are so, so really pound it to them. Okay, I know I'm being forceful here because hopefully they're watching it. Okay, the legislature, you know, you guys really got to push it to them. And I'd appreciate you guys do that. Uh, stand up for the people behind us because they're the ones that established this whole thing and made this whole thing possible. Okay, 30 more seconds. Um, last thing I want to say is, is you know, marijuana is about karma good at some point. I, everybody can describe it however they want. Okay, but legislatures, they're thinking money and whatnot. If you push it on them, uh, they'll agree to the amnesty equity program. Okay, you know, I mean, what are they going to do? Say no? They'll look really mean and ugly. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. All right, speaker two. Hi, my name is Orville. I'm part of the Oakland Equity Coalition. Uh, I'd like to say one thing. I've been, I've been around a long time. Uh, and uh, I remember in the 60s when we fought uh, for social justice, as you want to call it, but actually for um, the rights to go to school, um, the right to end the form of slavery. We fought very hard for it, and we're looking forward to um, some sort of renaming, that you named it, 
and it came out to be equity. I remember back then it was minority, and then everybody became a minority. What I'm looking at now is we very fought very hard, we're being incarcerated, and yet at the same time, they're changing the equity program to social equity. I would like to make sure that we understand that a lot of people haven't been through 400 years of slavery and, and so on and so forth and don't have the economics to move forward because they don't have the privilege or didn't have the privilege to move forward because of the social uh, stigma that is formulated behind so-called equity. So I want to name, rename it to equity equity. It's double. So that's what we really need to fight for is the equity equity because social equity takes away from the equity program. Thank you. Chair, that concludes public comment. Okay, we have a uh, motion and a second on the table. Any other comments from the members? I just have a comment, um, and I guess it's a comment and a question for the subcommittee. Um, so the recommendation speaks specifically to um, fees paid by people with disability and military veterans. And Nikita um, previously had brought up a, both a comment, and I don't know if it was a question, but I have a question. Does that also include entities whose primary purpose is to serve um, uh, disability and, and military veterans? Um, that's one point. And then the second um, point, I'd, and I guess recommendation that I would make for us to consider is um, I, I think uh, hearing from the public that it's important that we um, expand that um, to um, both people, entities, and, and that primarily serve and to um, equity and applicants of color. So I put that out for um, discussion more than making a motion right now. So it's a question and a discussion point. And Miss Yu, just for clarification, can you restate, uh, because I believe you had added in language regarding the equity. Of course. Thank you. The recommendation is the licensing authorities should evaluate the amount of annual fees, especially fees paid by people with disabilities, military veterans, and locally licensed equity applicants. Dr. Cermak. I move, well, I, I assume that the, uh, the Bureau can, by looking at gross receipts, uh, establish a fee schedule that would uh, cover expenses for all that we're talking about. And so I want to, uh, I move what I hope would be a friendly amendment that we add nonprofit compassion programs to the list. <laughs> Miss you? Yes. Be happy to take it. I'll second that. Mr. Barr. So, so I, I guess I still have the question. So this is specific to licensing that authority should evaluate the amount of annual fees, especially fees paid by, and we made the amendment. But what about entities who maybe aren't the individual applicant, but entities whose primary purpose is compassionate use or, um, you know, uh, to serve people with disabilities or veterans. Does that encompass that? Would I would think entities would be encompassed by the word applicants. Do you think it needs more well, clarification? It just says, it says per, by people. And so it's not necessarily, I mean, the individual maybe, but not necessarily. What if the individual wouldn't qualify, but the entity that whose primary purpose is to serve? And I think that's, you know. Uh, I, I think we could clarify this to, or modify this so it states the licensing authorities should evaluate the amount of annual fees, especially fees paid by applicants with uh, disabilities, um, applicants who serve in the military, locally licensed equity applicants, as well as Mr. Cermak's amendment. Just a point of clarification, under the Act, a person is defined as an individual, a corporation, an LLC. So um, it, it, if you're using, by people here, you're using people as used in the statute, it would also encompass entities. Oh, so it does. Okay, then thank you. 
Okay, any other comment? All right, seeing none, can we get a vote, please? Pavilion. Aye. Sir Mack. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Harada. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Leff. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevidal. Aye. Nikita. Aye. Peck. Aye. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Aye. Todd. Aye. Williams. Aye. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. You. Aye. Motion passes. All right. Um, moving on, let's uh, move to recommendation number five, Miss You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The recommendation number five relates to A and M licenses and the transition period. The recommendation is that we combine application and annual renewal fees for A and M licensees conducting the same business activities at the same license premises and to extend the grace period until January 1st, 2020 under section 5029 subdivision B1. Our subcommittee received extensive feedback on this issue and to recap, we heard concerns about significant duplicative costs to start up um, an AM business and support for extending the deadline to allow A&M licensees to conduct business. Our intent was to provide a grace period for the state to fully evaluate the market, account for the lag from local governments, provide some financial relief to A&M applicants, licensees, and further allow for a smooth transition for businesses. Staff comments? Business and Professions Code sections 26012 and 26180 at SEC provide for the collection of fees, including the requirement to establish a fee scale based on the size of the business that covers the cost of enforcement administration. The licensing authorities are not required to levy a specific fee and could explore a combined fee for a person seeking an, a, seeking an M and an A license for the same cannabis activity. Section 5029 of the Bureau's regulations provide for a transition period which allow licensees to conduct business with other licensees irrespective of the M or A designation. The regulations could be amended to change the end date of the transition period. However, this would further delay implementation of certain regulatory requirements. I would like to clarify um, in regard to the staff comments and refer to the recommendation that the intent of this was to only extend the grace period for section 5029 subdivision B1, which would allow licensees to conduct business um, with other licensees irrespective of the MRA designation on their license until January 1st, 2020. So there's no intent to delay implementation of the other requirements in section 5029, specifically B2 through B8. I move to adopt the recommendation number five as drafted. Okay, we need a second. I'll second it. All right, any, uh, any questions of the uh, committee chair or members? So I have a uh, question for the subcommittee. Um, you know, we've heard a lot um, in the past and we've certainly heard a lot today about small businesses being somewhat disadvantaged um, through the requirements of the regulations. And so I'm just wondering if there was discussion at your subcommittees for um, delaying the, um, the, the testing for um, smaller businesses as opposed to for all, because, you know, a year and a half um, delay, um, you know, would be, in my mind, make sense for smaller entities that are trying to, again, generate the revenue to be able to do some of the testing, whereas large entities that are already um, have substantial capital, but also maybe already complying with such um, requirements in other states, um, wouldn't necessarily um, need that additional time. So I'm just wondering if that was discussed. No, specifically, we did not delve into the testing issue. Um, our subcommittee focused more on the uh, business conducted between just A&M licensees. Just a point of clarification, the transition period on 5029 doesn't exactly, that they refer to doesn't specifically address the, um, the testing, the phase-in of the testing that's in the 
testing lab area of our regulations? I have a question. What would the fees associated with the M&A have to do with the testing and delaying the testing? Testing's got to be done anyway, so whether or not they're able to do business with each other as an A and an MM doesn't really take away anything having to do with testing. And in addition to that, if we're, if the comment is about the not delaying the transitional period until January to, because the labs are, what I'm trying to say is this, the labs even today are not ready to test product, especially at the scale of California. And if we don't delay the uh, transition period by another six months with the expectation that the labs are ready to go tomorrow, um, that's just not happening, that's not there. Uh, so we might actually end up creating more problems uh, because of the laboratory testing. As far as the M and an A, look, for all intents and purposes, the M is really only going to cover the 18 to 21 year old demographic that doesn't qualify for an adult use uh, purchase. There are a lot of municipalities that went through with a medical program delaying the adult use program in their community thinking, well, let's see what happens with medical. Those cities are not generating any revenues. Those the operations are not seeing any customers, any patients, call them what you want to call them. Because here's the other part, to qualify for the medical purchase, you would have to be registered with the county for your state issued cart. Realistically, how many people are going to go out and do that? So the transition period, as much as it would be really great to uh, take out the transition period and just go straight into it, we're just not there as a state. And the bottleneck, a lot of it has to do with licensing at the local level. If the local municipalities are not issuing the licenses, the state's not in a position to issue those licenses. The testing labs are not there yet. They're not licensed. They're not operational. The operators, there's still a lot of confusion <laughs> going on. So as far as the transition period and the extension of it, I would strongly support it. Uh, and by the way, that also has nothing to do with enforcement beginning or not beginning. It's two separate subjects. Mr. Boulian, I believe you inadvertently stated that uh, patients have to have county issue cards to be medical patients. Uh, state issued through the county. That's uh, not necessarily true. Your doctor's recommendation will qualify for a medical purchase. Yes. After the transition period. As presently. At present. Future. Yes. And the public health uh, recommendation was passed to not require the. Uh, the state uh, license or the state card. Mr. Wolsey. So generally speaking, I'm opposed to regulations that further delay the implementation of the program. Um, this would be an exception to that. Um, in particular, the combining of the fees, um, and this is a slightly related topic the, as far as the um, annual operating fee to run the program, having experience in regulating businesses who are both A and M licenses doing the same activity at the same place, um, it's actually easier to regulate them that way than it is um, if they ever, you know, multiple locations. Um, so I'm in support of that, and uh, I'm curious ab about where the 18 months came from. It, uh, they, they, I'm sorry, the 18 month delay in, uh, as opposed to like a year or six months or something. We wanted to give um, the state more time to evaluate everything. There's a lag in the, you know, what's going on with local government. We just wanted to ensure that there was enough time for this to be deliberately looked at. Thank you. OK. Mr. 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 One more question. I'm sorry. I did not notice it was 2020, January 1st. Uh, I thought we were talking about a six-month extension until January 1st, 19. So is the recommendation to take it to January of 2020? Yes. Um, would you accept a friendly amendment to make it an additional six months to January 19? And what is your reasoning? Six months, we're here. Um, six months, I think, should be a fair amount of time. Um, an additional 18 months to 2020. January, I think that's a little excessive. Um, um, if, if I may comment, I, in all due respect, I think um, if, if, if it were able, I mean, if we were able to um, address this today, um, 
I think the complete um, merger of A&M licensing even beyond 2020 would be um, very beneficial, especially to small businesses. Um, so I, I, I strongly support this having a, um, as much leeway in it as possible for A to work with M and for the fees to be combined. Can I ask for a clarification from the subcommittee chair? Um, the phraseology, it says, until January 1, 2020, under section 5029B1. So is that just meant to extend the grace period and not necessarily meant to apply to the recommendation that A and M have one and the same fee? Or Right, the two are separate okay. um, in terms of... Uh, how would be implemented, I, I guess. Okay, so just for clarification, that 2020 date is intended only to apply to just the extending period. section 5029 subdivision B1 and not intended on the renewal and license fees. That's kind of meant to be, an, for lack of a better word, an indefinite recommendation with no temporal end. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, any others? Mr. Cermak? Um, I guess I'm always concerned about the, uh, uh, the conflation between what's medical marijuana and what's recreational marijuana. And um, I, I understand that the nurseries are not wanting to designate it until they can see what the, uh, what the um, demand is for one versus the other. That, that's a kind of conflation. I'm wondering if this contributes in any way. Uh, to, to that conflation is is the track and trade uh, system still uh, is it in any jeopardy uh, is there going to be any crossing over of product because we're we're only doing one license um, it's a little confusing to me when it increases that conflation Ms. Hugh do you have a, any comments there no okay um, I can jump in a little bit here. Um, so track and trace will track product regardless of a, if it's, um, it can track all product. Okay, saying no other from the uh, committee, let's move to public comment, please. Uh, we're taking public comment on recommendation number five, just to remind everyone, and we'll start with speaker one. Hello, my name is Dorina Byrne. I'm a GMP, which is Good Manufacturing Practice Consultant for the manufacturing of cannabis goods at the moment. I have over 30 years' experience in big corporation, pharma, medical device, cosmetic, and OTC. And I say that because I've implemented quality systems for a long, long time. And it takes time. For companies with, currently with a base of systems in place, they have can have up to three years for changes to regulations. I'm talking federal regulations, and I'm talking ISO regulations. A case in point is ISO 13485, 2016, for the medical device industry, which went into place last year. They have till 2020 to implement, and that's a change. It was a significant change, but it was a change. I am training people now who have never been regulated, I have to do GAMP training from the basis of nothing. And I have to say that it's going to take more than six months. I can write fancy procedures, give them to you for your licenses. What's most importantly is the products on the market are safe and effective. And they'll only be safe and effective if these processes, and there is plenty of them, I'm telling you, I'm not talking about just lab testing. There's 20 or 30 processes that have to be put into place, and that's a minimum. They need till January 1st, 2020. And I know you're only talking about subpart B1, but I'm talking about the whole GMP Thank aspect. you. Speaker 2. Thank you. Ron Edwards, CK Nursery, recommending, uh, representing nurseries. Um, this is becoming very clear that this needs to be extended. Um, there is a 12-month window of business for THC strains. Um, we're seeing an extreme shortage of CBD strains for people who really need this type of medicine. And to pay the extra fees to only do four, four months of business is really onerous and it does not encourage that medicine to be available 
people. So we really need to get this structured so that it's worthwhile for the businesses to provide this medicine for people. Thank you. Thank Ron, you. Ron, you shaved. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Dr. William Norman Munjar. I'd like to say that I have now completed the cannabis event organizer license from the state, the commercial cannabis licensee bond, which most of you don't know that you need. The local license from the local municipality, we are now 100 complete in the processing. These fees, whoever is generating these fees, I ask them and challenge them to tell me how they're determining the cost of processing and, and and regulating this and, and enforcing this when they don't even know this industry has just started. So I question how are they deriving these fees? Second, I say that what is the difference in this state cards, medical and these coming together? There has to be a union. Third, people believe that you have to apply for the local license, local license, local license first. There's a clause that says you can apply for the state license. It will send it to the local municipality. They have 60 days to act. If they do not, you are granted your temporary license by the state. Then, with the temporary license, go back to your local hometown municipality and lobby your counselors and your people to accept the state license and issue you the local, and I did all of this for zero. The business license for veteran was free. The administration from them so far has been free. There has been no $150,000. I did it free for the people. Thank you. All right, speaker one. Susan Tibben. With regards to the transition period, uh, an informal survey of the dispensaries with whom we have worked with legally for the past number of years is that uh, ratio specific, specific medicines, as one of the other speakers mentioned, are in very, very short supply. Mm -hmm. With regard to dispensaries, these products have been paid for by the retail outlet. They've been inventoried and audited by the state and entered into track and trace. There is a mechanism in place to inform customers that the products may not be completely compliant with current regulations. Forcing destruction of paid for products with no precedent for forecasting is unfair, it's unconscionable. The mechanics are already in place. Therefore, the transition period should be modified to read until all products are sold or destroyed by the dispensary at their discretion. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, Paul Hansbury. Um, I wanted to echo what speaker, the previous speaker said, that the products that are currently paid for by the retailers, uh, they have until July 1st to, um, to sell them or have them destroyed, pay to have them destroyed after they've already paid for them. Um, this, the, there's a mechanism already in place, as she stated, for them to be labeled as such, and they should be able to recoup the, the monies that they paid for these products uh, until they're sold, uh, using the same stickers, the same child-proof labels, the same conditions that are in place right now. The July 1st deadline for that, the grace period, uh, would be unreasonable, and uh, I don't understand why there's a deadline there. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 3. Jude Tillman. I'm on the board of the Mendocino Cannabis Industry Association. To, at this point, I'm reading a statement from uh, Hannah Nelson, who is a Mendocino-based attorney and longtime cannabis policy advocate. She was sick and could not join us today. Her statement reads as follows. In addition to the issue of combining fees, which is important and helpful, it is imperative that farmers in particular, but all other operators, have a longer period of time for transition while the legislature decide, discusses whether to eliminate distinction between A and M. AB 2929 coming up. A single misjudgment on how the market might pan out, choosing A instead of M or vice versa, could bankrupt the small farmer op or operator. A single pest invasion of an M designated crop could leave the operator with no M plants to fill an order, even if they have plenty of A plants. No one knows yet how to plan in these uncertain times. Don't let the unnecessary designation set so many small businesses up for failure. Track and trace does not have to be delayed. Just allow A&M to be interchangeable, at least at the plant level, for a greater period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so I uh, represent a lot of growers as well and producers uh, like to go by the belief that there is no s such difference as medical. All marijuana is medical, whether you're an adult using it or a kid. I don't grow medical plants or adult use plants. It's all for medicine and therefore since the designation doesn't come really, it has no bearing except for tax purposes that shouldn't be delineated until the point of sale at the retail level for tax purposes. A&M licensing only makes it more difficult for small growers and farmers because they have to decide up front and therefore it limits their ability to make, make money because they don't know which way the demand is going to go so therefore there shouldn't be any delineation. So I, I support the, the advance till 2020. There's some municipalities that don't even have their local ordinances and they're denying state licenses and that won't happen until 2019 so they need that extra time to be able to get in and, and establish their businesses so thank you for your time thank you speaker two ross gordon california growers association um, we definitely support this recommendation i'd say it's um, among the top if not the top regulatory concern that our members had is somehow finding a solution to some of these issues with the a and markets, um, and this recommendation does address that. Um, one thing I think we'd want to add to that is we would like to find a more permanent solution to this problem. I think maybe some of the reason of, of this debate about 2019 or 2020 is that it, it's a little um, unset, dissatisfying to be talking about extending transition periods to a problem with the a and markets that is going to continue to exist, and so there needs to be some real solution to those issues. The double licensing fees is definitely a major issue and I'm glad this recommendation uh, deals with that. Um, some other issues in the a and markets which are maybe less directly addressed by this recommendation um, but have been mentioned previously, the ability to transfer between the a and markets with a product. Um, if you know the medical market does not have enough supply, it should be possible to get a product into that market, a transfer through the A market. Um, the requirement to separate a premises for A&M for a producer makes it very, very hard to predict these things in advance. Um, and so I, I think our approach, we're, we're gonna be um, putting together or putting forward a proposal that is sort of comprehensive about how to address a lot of these concerns at the same time, um, while also understanding there are some federal issues here as well with the difference between adult use and medical. Um, so um, would encourage people continuing to pay attention to this issue, thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Hi, I'd like to, th my name is Alan. I'm with Green Rush Consulting. I'd like to second everything that Ross just said. I'd like to also bring in sort of a little bit more of the conversation around what, why we even have a medical program in the first place. I think that there's a lot of reasons, but one in particular is that the medical program uh, federally has about 95% support from, from uh, uh, the people of this country. Um, one of the major reasons why you want to have a medical license program is because if the federal government does come down on us, um, we want to make sure that we at least have some form of an industry that's left when the reckoning of that comes through. Now hopefully that doesn't happen, but that's, that's one of the major reasons for having a medical program. Um, making sure that it's, um, that, that we are not putting retailers in a position where they're considering getting rid of their medical licenses because they don't see enough people coming through with the county ID cards, which by the way, get rid of your ability to, um, you know, th there's also the, the gun rights issue that is associated with having that, that um, county ID card. That's a problem, it needs to be dealt with at some point. Um, but we do want to keep the medical program alive. At some point, I would like a medical program to consist of my doctor or my hospital. Uh, we're not there yet because of the federal issue. But when we're talking about medical, we're, the federal issue needs to be a consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Liana Held with the Green Cross for a dispensary that's been in California and operational since 2004. We currently applied for and received our temporary medical, uh, medical and adult licenses for distribution and for manufacturing. We fully support not um, bringing the having to create products that are medical and adult. It seems like an added level of bureaucracy. So definitely support the transition time until 2020. Um, it's just the industry just isn't there, and it's difficult to even find the products for people in the industry to make specific products and bring them into the store that are medical and adult. So, and I support a lot of what other people have already said about extending the deadline. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. 
Hi, Sabrina Fendrick, Berkeley Patients Group, in support of Recommendation 5. Um, uh, uh, excuse me. We also uh, support the extension to 2020 as well as uh, removing the dual licensing fees, which is uh, unreasonably expensive. You're talking about, in, in terms of retail, the same premises, the same product, the same inspection. The only difference is who can buy it and for how much. Um, a year and a half is really not that long, and it will t allow us for an easier transition into the legal market and minimize supply shortages due to inaction by local jurisdictions who fail to opt into the adult use market. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Uh, my name is Valerie Corral, and I'm the director of WAM, co-founder uh, out of Santa Cruz. And I wanted to speak to the issue of the July 1st. Uh, we support the 2020 extension, but July 1st is daunting. We have not been open since January 1st. Uh, I would not have ever thought that legalization would have stopped us when the DEA couldn't, but it, this is exactly what happened. And <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is daunting. We're sitting on a mountain of cannabis products. Um, it is impossible to think that I can do anything with this but maybe build a house. Um, which I could use. So um, it's, you know, we really have to look more deeply at what's happening to the people who are in business, who have been in business, and who have the cost that it's, that, and burden that it's been on our lives to do this work. Um, I think that uh, you need to expand your definitions, and I'm grateful that you're, you're here listening to us because I suspect that that is exactly what will happen. Your knowledge will grow with the information that we're providing you because we have been hands-on. So thank you for your time and thanks for listening. Thank you. And thank you for what you will do for us. All right, speaker one. Uh, yes, hello, Adam Villarreal, U.S. Navy vet, also representing a firm that is engaging in the social equity program. Um, I wanted to come out and second the support of the January 1st, 2020 uh, date, moving that back, and also specifically uh, the transfer between A and M. Uh, again, we also feel that if it's the same type of products in the same type of space, you should be able to transfer them in between. One thing I wanted to speak to that hasn't come up is one of the testing requirements attached to both of these licenses. Um, there is a large portion of uh, medical cannabis that undergoes the testing process under both of these licenses is then mandated to be destroyed by the state. Why isn't that being used for compassionate use? You literally have medicine, perfectly good medicine, that just went through a testing standard that's being thrown away instead of being given to the people who need it. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker mm -hmm. two. Um, my name is Joseph, uh, Joseph Evans. I have been lab director at two previous labs in Colorado, thinking about starting a third one here. Um, and addressing the comment, this does affect the testing labs, the designation of a and um, And to put it briefly and try to explain this, as a lab director, it cost me about three quarters of a million to a million dollars to buy analytical instrumentation. There are about half a dozen manufacturers of this analytical instrumentation who have more or less switched their policy back and forth as to whether or not they're even going to sell me the analytical, analytical instrumentation to do the testing. And one of these manufacturers recently told me that they would allow me, they would sell me the instrumentation, allow me to use it if 50% of what was coming in was designated as M and not A. And it was sort of interesting to me because it was like, well, if I don't really know, I can tell them this under the guise that I have 50% coming in as adult or as medical as opposed to adult use. They're just sort of taking this conservative stance. Point being that the longer you delay this, the better it is for the uh, testing lab. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Thank you. Uh, Max Piccolos on behalf of the California Cannabis Delivery Alliance and Flocana in support of recommendation number five. Um, we think that's very important. Both aspects of the recommendation are very critical for the transition to the regulated market. Um, first and foremost, the extension through January 1, 2020, um, an 18 month extension uh, of the AM interoperability would be very beneficial to prevent supply chain disruptions. 
Uh, furthermore, we don't know when these recommendations will in fact be adopted. They could be adopted in you know, uh, January 119, in which case this would be moot. So uh, 18 months is preferable or complete um, elimination of the differentiation between A and M um, would be preferable to a temporary fix. Uh, secondly, on the licensing fee side, um, wanted to speak in support of a combined license fee for A and M or reduction, the whole uh, being less than some of the parts um, in as much as there is not much additional paperwork, compliance need, inspections to justify two full license fees for two full licenses with a co-located A&M premises. So for the ease of business and the ease of the Bureau and other licensing authorities, we urge the combination of those. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker One. Hi there. My name's Alex Shadani, and I wanted to speak to the point that a lot of people have talked about the grower's concern about having to designate the difference between A and M, but from a manufacturer and distributor's standpoint, having to differentiate the two if they qualify for either as far as the milligram level, that having to separate the two while they're in manufacturing and distribution leaves the potential for having large surpluses in one area while the other has need. And I want to suggest that we do not have to specify whether it's A and M until it leaves distribution and goes to the actual point of sale and to customers. Thank you. Speaker two. <clears throat> Vera Levitt Casey for Mankind Dispensary. I stand with just about everyone else who's been up here. Hopefully you guys have really good understanding of the cost of designating A&M at seed level. I speak for a retailer. I'm gonna go ahead and support designation at the point of sale. We're already doing it. We don't have enough data at six months to tell you how many of our medical patients are now not renewing their medical recommendations and going specifically to adult use. For them, it doesn't really make a difference unless they're a user that needs medicine. In our case in San Diego, we also have a city tax. Uh, about $50 a month in medicine. It's worth them keeping their uh, medical designation. Lots of folks don't care. The city surely would like us to go adult use only. They'd make a whole lot of money off of us, but it is already causing us problems with uh, having enough inventory. I don't know what's happening with licensing, but I know that a lot of folks had their temporary licenses expire at the beginning of this month, and we've already had distributors and manufacturers who were unable to keep those licenses. We're already missing products on the shelf. So this is an issue, and that 18 months gives time for statutory change. Nobody has talked about that yet. Some of the designation change requires a statutory change. That requires voting cycles, and we need some time to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Hi, I'm John Brower from Trinity County, and I want to encourage you to uh, push this off till January of 2020. It makes a lot of sense. I, out in the industry, I haven't heard too many reasons to, uh, to keep a separation between A and M. Um, I think there could be a, a qualitative difference or a, a different standard for a, a truly medical grade uh, and possibly a lesser standard for adult use. But uh, I think the distinction should probably be made at the retailer or distributor level uh, to have this redundant uh, second licensing to hit uh, the cultivators and every other license type in the industry right now makes no sense. Uh, this is one uh, uh, item that does justify pushing off. I want to encourage you to stick to July 1st as the start date for mandatory lab pass, mandatory track and trace. We absolutely need a distinction in the marketplace for the consumer between white market product and other product. This is safety being the top concern and we've got to generate demand for this white market product immediately. Trinity County needs it desperately, and I, I think a lot of our other producer counties uh, will think likewise. Thank you. All right, Speaker One. Hi, Nolan Moyer from Saratech Corp. I agree with many of the comments that were issued today before us, and I just want to reiterate that, yes, we should combine the A&M license fees as they're too high at the moment, and also just even the application as well to even consider eliminating A&M. You have to go through double data entry every single time to go through these applications. It's a very redundant process. In addition uh, to the A&M question, hypothetically, if the distribution level, if there is a testing result that pushed a threshold of a packaged product from a manufacturer into the medical range, 
how would we rectify that issue? I wanted to really think about these situations where we do have a and differences and we should actually consider what those thresholds are. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, um, I'm David Lang on behalf of uh, the Green Cross. Um, and uh, we just, I'd just like to reiterate that uh, the having, the <laughs> continuing the separation of A&M really is just in kind of an arbitrary uh, you know, uh, extra regulation that does not need to happen. Um, I, it makes sense at the retail level where they are taxed differently. But uh, before that, there's absolutely no reason. It's all the same product, more or less, until it goes to the consumer. In addition, many of the people who sell uh, us our you know, products, um, they do not already have everything separated by A&M. And almost all of our products would have to go off the shelves for not being able to be as compliant as necessary if this were to go through. This is a, you know, this is a, a company that has a long history of being Extre you know, being on the forefront and being extremely helpful towards uh, those with medical needs. And uh, I, and so, yeah, I think that we definitely need to push this off a little further before, you know, and let every, at least push, the, push this off and let everybody get compliant before trying to separate on um, the A&M like this. Thank you. S speaker three. Mr. Grafilo, committee members, thank you. Uh, Dan Georgiatis again. Um, I want to respond to your concern, Sergeant Woolsey, about the 18 months. It was for a legislative fix to be poss possibly done within that time. Um, I participated in the licensing application subcommittee. Uh, but, but now that I think of it, besides that, if there is no fix, it, it could give the market time to figure out the supply chain dynami dynamics and you know, possibly comply with what's on the books currently. Um, and as, as for in increased conflation, as we've heard before, um, there's limited differences between the M and the A products. Um, there's THC limits on concentrates, and there's also sales and possession limits um, on the flower. Um, and the edibles are actually going to come in line uh, with M and A. Um, so it really, it's sort of an invisible threshold um, already. And I encourage you to vote yes on this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Fleurard, I'll be real quick. Um, I'm pulling for the six-month thing, so that come, like, November, we can talk about this again, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chair, that closes public comment. All right. Any other comments from the uh, members? <coughs> Mr. Shermack. <coughs> uh, boy, I agree with everyone. And... <laughs> Because everyone has some real good points. Um, I, I definitely agree with the um, delay until t 2020. Um, I really uh, am concerned about, um, in a sense, getting rid of this designation at certain points, even though I understand why it makes sense at the at the early growing level, at the distribution level, not so much at the manufacturing level. But um, I, I look at the Rohrbach, what is it, the Rohrbach Farr uh, Amendment in Congress that prohibits the Department of Justice from closing down state medical marijuana programs. And if we begin conflating the two uh, here, uh, we put ourselves in jeopardy. And so I really think that the cost part could be taken, the cost of licensing could be taken care of by adjustments for, from gross receipts. And that might be a way of being able to continue the, the distinction at all levels uh, in order to protect ourselves, uh, but uh, not having the level of burden of cost that we do now. Any others? Mr. Yes. Um, LeVon Peck, I just wanted to say that um, in this, I was on, on the subcommittee and uh, this was a very enlightening and I think it was, there was a lot of people in the room and I think it opened a lot of eyes as to the difficulty that you all are having and um, I'm hoping that uh, we listen to you 
and that we are able to extend this and go to 2020 because you all bring up some very good points that I think that the advisory board needs to look at. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Bobolian. Um, I'd like to clarify some. The m and designation, this was a topic of discussion in every single subcommittee, in almost every single subcommittee. It was unanimous that we should have some sort of consolidation because outside of intent, uh, intent of the use and the tax that goes with it, there is no difference between medical or adult use. That said, um, on the, this affects the supply chain more than anything else because after January 2019, the collective model is out. After January 1st, if even with the transition period, this is more for the license holder to license holder uh, relationship than the license holder to the consumer. If you're in a municipality that just issues you a medical license, you would still not be able to have an adult use sale to a consumer. So that's part I missed on the, when I made my comment. So it's not about not extending it. It's not about not combining them. It has to be able, uh, combined. It should be combined. And I also didn't realize it was on the taxes, but I just wanted to point out that the public comments all made sense. This is more of a supply chain issue um, than anything else, and it doesn't really um, open it up for patient access. One of the hesitations I had with extending it out is this has to change, and unless there's a hard date, unless there's a cutoff, there's no incentive to change anything. So um, that, thank you. Can, can, I, can I get a point of clarification from our attorney? I think in our other, like uh, Avis discussed, that it probably was in every subcommittee. But um, the reason we didn't really put it on our recommendations list is that to be able to eliminate or merge them uh, was statutory. Um, it kind of prohibited us from that. But you could combine fees. The fee piece was, was what was allowed. Is that correct? Um, fees could certainly be combined. Um, additionally, the statute does require a designation, but it right. it doesn't get into the specifics about whether or not A can do business with M and M can do business with A. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, seeing no other comments, let's go ahead and call for the vote. Baboyan. Aye. Cermak. Nay. Clifford. Aye. Dombrowski. Aye. Fair. Aye. Harada. Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Leff? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevidal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Todd? Aye. Williams? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we are going to uh, take a quick break. We will reconvene here at 1.30. Uh, for members, though, we have Mr. Sweeney absent uh, today. Uh, he was the chair of the subcommittee on microbusiness. Excuse me, hang on. Keep it down a little, thank you. Uh, he was the chair for subcommittee on microbusiness. I'm gonna need one of the other committee members to uh, step up to provide the report and guidance uh, for that place. <laughs>